Hi, this is Don McAllister, and welcome to another Screencasts Online training video. If you need any help in using the video player to do such things as jumping to the various chapters, navigating using the playback controls, or accessing the subtitles, just click on Help in the menu bar. SEO Tutor for Mac is a new video tutorial specifically designed for people with limited experience or even no experience of using a Mac. Perhaps you're a Windows user trying a Mac for the first time or an iPad or iPhone user wanting to get to grips with your new Mac. Either way, this tutorial will explain how to get the most out of your Mac from scratch. For a more in-depth look at some of the more complex features of Lion, check out SEO Tutor for Lion on the Mac App Store, or head over to screencastonline.com to check out the weekly tutorials available to Screencast Online members. Now, Apple computers are available in a wide range of configurations and price points suitable for most users. In desktops, they range from the Mac Mini to the iMac with its built-in display, right up to the Mac Pro for professional users. For portable computing, the MacBook Air and the MacBook Pro ranges offer the best and most powerful laptops on the market. One thing that they all have in common is that they all run OS X. OS X is the operating system that powers your Mac, allowing you to run applications and connect to the internet. Unusually, OS X also comes with a wide range of applications as standard, at no extra cost. Now, the current version of OS X is 10.7, or as it's more commonly known, Lion. This is the version that's supplied with all new Macs, and it's the version I'll be using in this tutorial. Before we start looking at the software, there's a couple of terms we need to clarify, and also a couple of myths we need to dispel. Now, as well as the keyboard, which we'll look at shortly, you'll most likely be using either a mouse or a trackpad. Now, I'm using a MacBook Air with a built-in trackpad for this particular tutorial, but you might well want to add a mouse or an external trackpad to your system if it's a desktop machine. So let's start with the mouse and uh, dispel a few myths in the meantime. Now, you can buy a Magic Mouse from Apple, or you can use any USB mouse, and yes, you can use a two-button mouse. Now, to configure a two-button mouse or any mouse, let's jump straight into looking at a special control panel within OS X, and that's the System Preferences panel. Now, the System Preferences panel is accessible through, well, through various methods. Uh, OS X does give you lots of different options to either load or access different parts of the system. Uh, but what I'm going to do, just for simplicity, is just go down to this mechanism down at the bottom of the screen. This is the dock, and we'll talk more about the dock shortly. Uh, just to point out that I've installed a separate application that allows me to track my mouse pointer as it moves along the desktop. So that's really just there to help you keep an eye on where the mouse pointer is. Okay, let's start by opening the System Preferences panel. So I'll just double click on the icon in the dock. System Preferences are very much like the control panel within Windows, and we'll be coming back to the System Preferences panel several times during the tutorial. But for now, we'll just have a look at the one we're interested in, which is the mouse. The first thing I'm going to do is configure my system with an Apple Magic Mouse. So if I click on the Magic Mouse symbol, you see it's waiting for a Bluetooth mouse to be discovered or to connect a USB mouse. Now, as I mentioned before, you can connect any make of mouse. So if you have an old USB mouse that you want to use with your Mac, uh, it's perfectly acceptable. Just plug it into the USB port and configure it through this particular panel. But I have a, a magic mouse, so I'm going to switch that on. It's found at McAllister D's mouse. I've actually used this mouse before on this particular machine. Uh, again, for information, I've rebuilt this machine from scratch. So everything you should see uh, should be pretty much indicative of a brand new machine. So uh, let me just go ahead and say continue. Okay, and our mouse is now connected. Now it's quite useful in that Apple have included some demo videos within the system preferences panel for the mouse. So you can actually check out all the different gestures that are included within Lion. Uh, I won't look at gestures too much now. What I do want to do is uh, go across to point and click. And I want to switch on my secondary click so I can actually do a right click on my mouse. Okay, and that's fine. Uh, to get back to the main part, or to see all the elements in the system preferences panel, just click on show all, and that will take you back. But now if I move away from my trackpad, I now have my mouse connected. I can right click, so if I right click on the desktop, we get some special menus appearing. I'll tell you more about these special menus 
as we move through the tutorial. But that's my mouse configured. Uh, so let's go ahead now and also have a look at configuring a Magic Trackpad. Because this is a laptop, it already has a trackpad built in. So if I go across to the trackpad option within System Preferences and click to open it, you'll see, I again, I get some videos explaining what the different gestures are. So again, you can come back to this and have a look at some of the gestures, but we will cover gestures in more detail later on in the tutorial. Uh, what I want to do, though, first off, is to configure my built-in trackpad, one to tap with one finger, and also to support a three-finger drag. That allows me to move the windows just by moving three fingers on the trackpad. Uh, let's have a look at scroll and zoom. Yep, that's all fine. And more gestures as well. I will switch on app expose. So that's the built-in trackpad. Now, if you have a desktop machine, or if you want to use one of the magic trackpads with your laptop for the bigger surface area, you can also add an additional trackpad in by using this option here, set up Bluetooth trackpad. Now, if I just press the button in on the right-hand side of my Magic Trackpad. Okay, it's now found a device. We say Continue. So it's found McAllister D's trackpad. Okay, so we have a low battery. I'll have to replace the batteries in it. But there we go. There's my Bluetooth trackpad. Uh, you can see it's a much larger size. We still have the various gestures that we can have a look at. Again, I'm going to go to check all of these. Yep, they're fine. Okay, that's great. So now I have my built-in trackpad and also my Bluetooth trackpad. Now it looks as though I have to change the batteries as well. We're down to 10% within the batteries within the external trackpad. But I can sort that out later. Okay, let's go back to show all. To close the system preferences panel, I need to go up into the top corner. And you see we have these traffic lights. Now on some windows, we have a green, orange and red button. For this one, we just have the orange and the red. Now, the orange allows us to minimize the window, which we don't want to do at this point. We want to close the window. So I'm going to click on the red button, and that's now closed. Uh, we'll look more at window handling later on in the tutorial. This section is all about the Apple keyboard. Now, it really does depend on what model of Mac you're using, uh, which country you're in, which language you're using. Uh, that really determines the uh, layout and the labels on the keys of your keyboard. But there are some similarities and there are some particular keys that do cause confusion. So I want really to uh, explain exactly what the different keys are on a sort of a generic keyboard. And we'll use this one here. This is the Apple wireless keyboard. Uh, this is actually a US keyboard and you can tell that from the layout of the keys, especially the currency key, which is on the number four. Across the top of the keyboard are the function keys. Now these are a number of keys that normally have dual purpose. Uh, the first key on the left-hand side is the escape key. But from F1 to F12, these are all dual purpose keys. Now the dual purpose is either to act as a function key in an application or to act as a system-wide key, normally represented by these small graphical symbols on the keyboard itself. So for instance, uh, F1 and F2, if you have an Apple connected monitor or a laptop with a built-in screen, these will alter the brightness of your monitor. Uh, F3 will invoke mission control. So if I just tap F3 on my keyboard, so we pop in and out of Mission Control. More about Mission Control later. And also Launchpad, which is F4. And again, we'll look at that in brief later. F5 and F6 are actually blank on this particular machine. But if you have a laptop with uh, an illuminated backlit display, these will control the intensity of your backlit display. Now, F7 to F9 are all media playback controls. And these integrate fully with iTunes. So you can stop and start iTunes or fast forward or rewind. F10 is a mute key to mute your sound, and then F11 and F12 will control the volume. And some of these keys actually do provide an on-screen display. So for instance, if I want to increase the volume of the audio on this machine, I can just hit F12, and then F11 to reduce the volume. And the final key on the row of function keys is an eject key on the keyboard displayed, but on some laptops, this might be the power key. Let's just put this image of the keyboard to one side and let's actually bring up uh, a software keyboard just to allow me to demonstrate some particular features of using the keyboard. Okay, this is the built-in software keyboard. Um, I'll perhaps show you later on in the tutorial how to access this, but I just thought it would be useful for me to demonstrate a few features that you might be aware of. Now, on the second row down uh, underneath the function keys, on the far right-hand side is the delete key. Now, usually on the Mac, when you press the delete key, and I've used text edit here, which is just above the software keyboard window, 
And text edit is one of the built-in applications that you get with OS X. Uh, it's a fully featured word processor actually, but I just wanted to show you the delete key. Now this does confuse people in that if I hit the delete key, it will actually start deleting backwards. Okay, but uh, if I want to delete forwards, uh, if I just position the cursor using the arrow keys to before the IS, and I want to delete forwards now, not backwards, if I hold down the function key, which is the one in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll notice that the backspace key now turns into a forward delete key. So if I hit the same key again, it will delete forwards. Now I'm going to undo uh, those deletions. Now I could do it through the menu option in the menu bar, but I'm going to use a what's pretty much a standard way of undoing something, and that's using another special key called the command key. Now you'll notice down at the bottom, next to the function key, we have three keys with some strange symbols on. Uh, there's the function key, then there's what's called the control key, then the alt or option key, and then the command key. And you'll notice that the alt or option key and the command key are also replicated on the right-hand side of the spacebar. Now these uh, do appear differently on different keyboards. If I just bring that graphic back of the actual keyboard, you'll see this one does have it spelt out as control, and then we have a small alt or option, and then we have command, and then the command symbol as well. Now other keyboards might have CTRL for control. Uh, they might just have the uh, squiggly symbol for the alt or option key. Uh, or they might just have CMD for command. So this is an area of huge confusion for people. But if you learn to recognize them as control, alt or option, and then command. And to undo my typing or my deletions, I just hold down the command key and press Z or Z. Now, because I've done several deletions, I'll have to do that several times. So again, command Z, and there's all my text back. The command key is also used in copy and paste. So for instance, if I copy the word text, so if I hold down the shift key and then use the left hand arrow key to select text and then do a command C, that has now copied the text to the clipboard. If I move along, insert a space and do command V, that will paste it back in for me. So if I select those two words, again, hold down the shift key, use the arrow key to paint the area I want to this time cut and then do command X, that will cut it for me. And then to paste it back from the clipboard, command V. So command Z to undo something, uh, command C to copy, command X to cut, and command V to paste it back. So that's enough of the uh, keyboard. There are some other features which we'll look at later, but uh, for now, let's start having a look at some of the other elements that make up the OS X desktop. So this is the standard OS X desktop, and it's actually made up of three components, three separate things that we'll look at individually. Uh, the first is the dock. So down here at the bottom, with all these icons, we have the dock. Uh, we have the desktop area itself, and then across the top, we have the menu bar. So let's start off by taking a look at the dock first and seeing what the dock is used for. The dock really has two main functions. One is to store all the icons of the applications that you most commonly use so you can retrieve them very easily and start applications up directly from the dock. But it also has a function to let you know that different applications are running. So for instance, down here, if we look at the different types of applications, so this first one uh, is the Finder. That's the sort of main file management application within OS X. Uh, we have Launchpad, and the dock does actually predate Launchpad. Launchpad is a new way of accessing applications that are installed on the Mac. Uh, we have Mission Control, we have the Mac App Store, we have Mail. Uh, we have Safari, which is the OS X web browser. Uh, FaceTime, so the application we use to communicate with other Mac users or people using iPads or iPhones. Address book, uh, iCal, which is the calendar application. iTunes, Photo Booth, to enable you to create all those uh, weird and wonderful photographs. Uh, system preferences. And then these three applications here are, are applications that I'm running. Uh, these first set of icons are installed by default into the dock. I'm actually running text edit which we used before in the keyboard section, uh, an application called Activity Monitor and an application called ScreenFlow. And that's the, uh, that's the application that I'm using to capture the screen. Now you'll notice below these three applications, we have these small blue dots. And these indicate that these applications are actually running 
uh, at the moment. And also Finder. Now Finder runs pretty much continuously, so you should always see a blue dot. Now you can configure it to remove these blue dots, but uh, we'll leave them switched on for now so you get a better understanding. The dock itself is actually in two parts. If we go back across to the right hand side, you'll see we have this uh, vertical bar. And as I move across the vertical bar, my cursor changes. More about that shortly. Uh, but over here, we have two folders, my documents folder and also my downloads folder. And then we also have the trash. So this is where files that get deleted get placed into the trash. Uh, let's have a look at uh, this vertical bar first before we examine the folders. I can actually click down on my mouse and then change the size of the dock just by moving my mouse cursor up and down. I can also right or control click. And by control click, I mean if you have a single uh, single button mouse, you can hold down the control key and then click your mouse. But I have a two button mouse, so I can right click. That gives me this pop up menu. Now I can turn hiding on. So if I don't want to see the dock, I can switch that on and the dock will disappear. And then it will only reappear when I move my cursor down to the bottom. Again, if I uh, position my cursor over the vertical bar, right click, I can turn magnification on. Now magnification, let me just switch hiding back off again. Uh, magnification allows the dock to sort of magnify as you move your cursor across all the different icons. Now this is really useful if you have made your dock very small. Uh, if you have lots of icons, magnification allows you to find the icon that you want very, very easily. Let me just make that a bit bigger again. So again, position the cursor over the central divider and then move up or down to change the size. Right click again, position on screen. You can position the dock to the left hand side of your screen or to the right hand side of your screen or the bottom. If I select right, you'll see we get uh, a 2D representation of the dock. Exactly the same, it works the same as it did before, but this time it's uh, anchored to the right hand side of the screen. Select left and it will be anchored to the left hand side. But uh, I tend to leave mine anchored to the bottom, to be honest. Uh, other options, uh, minimize using. Uh, two different effects to minimize applications down to the dock, uh, a genie effect and a scale effect. If I show you that quickly, if I uh, bring up text edit, and then I minimize this, you'll see that sort of genie effect. Let me uh, show you that again. If I go back and restore it, but this time I'll hold the shift key down while I minimize, and I minimize by clicking on the orange button or the yellow button in the traffic lights. That will actually slow the effect down. So there we have our genie effect. And you'll notice that the minimized applications appear on the right hand side of the dock. Now the other effect is the scale effect. If I just pop that back up, minimize using scale effect. Let's bring text edit back up. Again, I'll use the shift key so we get a more pronounced effect. Minimize, and then we just get the scaling rather than the genie effect. Let me go back and reset that. In fact, I'll reset it by going into Dock Preferences. Now this is a module within the System Preferences panel that we looked at before. And here I can control such things as the size of the dock, the magnification, the position on screen, uh, the minimize options using Scale or Genie, uh, everything we could do from the pop-up menu before. So let me change this scale effect back to the Genie effect. Uh, some additional options, so you can minimize windows into the application icon. So if you don't want your minimized applications appearing on the right-hand side of the keyboard, you can minimize them into the application icon itself. Uh, controls for animation, uh, controls to automatically hide and show the dock, and also the option to show the indicator lights for open applications. Okay, let's close the system preferences panel down. To remove icons from the dock, it's very straightforward. In fact, you can drag them off the dock very easily with your mouse. So for instance, if I wanted to uh, remove my mission control icon from the dock, let's say I'm going to be using gestures to invoke mission control. All I do is just grab the icon with the mouse and drag it off. And then when I let go, you'll see we have this little cloud symbol. When I let go, it disappears with a poof. Now you haven't deleted anything. All you've done is to remove the icon from the dock. Let's do that one more time. There's another way to do that. Uh, I can control or right click, go to options, and say remove from dock from here. And again, that's gone. Now to add things into the dock, it's very straightforward. Uh, we need to do it from the finder. So if I open finder for the first time, 
Uh, let's say go to application. Now we will look at find it in a lot more detail later on, but I'm just going to go to my applications folder. Uh, let's say I wanted my calculator to always be in the dock. I can just drag and drag it down to the dock and then let go. The icons to the right hand side of the separator bar are slightly different to the normal icons on the left hand side. These are folders. So these are folders within your file system, but are placed on the dock as things called stacks. Now, this is just really an easy way for you to access folders that you might want to uh, access frequently. So the two installed by default are your documents folder and also your downloads folder. Uh, remember, this is the minimized text edit. In fact, let me get rid of the minimized application. I'll close this particular document down by clicking on the red X. You'll notice that uh, text edit actually isn't closed. That's still running in the background. I've just closed that document window. OK, so back to stacks. So this is my document stack. If I click on the stack, you'll see that I get this sort of fan display of all the documents that are contained within that particular folder. Uh, if I want to view them in the Finder, I can go up to the top, click on this button here, and that will open them in the Finder so I can see them. OS X handles PDF documents brilliantly in that uh, you can do all sorts of things from them at the file level. Uh, there's also a separate application called Preview, which enables you to uh, view them in great detail. But uh, let's close the Finder down again. And if I go back to the stack and control or right click, you'll see we get some controls. So I can sort the contents of this particular stack. I can display it in different ways. So if you don't like it being displayed as a stack within your dock, you can actually change the display to a folder. Uh, I must admit, I do prefer to see it as a folder. Again, if I click on it, we get this fan display. Let me right click so we can view contents as a fan, as a grid. Now, if I click it, we get a grid of documents. Right click again as a list. Right click again as automatic. The automatic setting uh, depends on how many documents there are within that particular folder. And the presentation of content will be chosen as the optimal presentation for that number of documents. So that's how you configure your stacks. If you want to add an additional folder into your dock as a stack. Very straightforward. Let's just click away from here. If we go across to the finder, uh, let's say I wanted to move this capture folder, which is in my finder across to my stack. There we, go. we just position it. It has to be on the right hand side of the separator bar. But uh, once you have a space for it, if we let go, there we have our new capture folder as a stack on the dock. Again, I can right click, go in now, change it as a, a folder display. Click on it and I see my three files within that particular folder. So that stacks within the dock. Now to finish off this section, I'm just going to close down the finder, and I'm also going to switch hiding on to remove the dock from view. Another big change for people coming across to the Mac, say from the Windows platform, is the Apple menu bar. Now this is the bar that you see running across the top of your primary display. So this bar here. Uh, if you have a multi-monitor display, it will only appear on your primary monitor. Now, it's different from Windows in that the menu bar is on the primary display. It's not attached to the individual application windows. Although the menu bar is a single bar, it's actually comprised of four separate parts. The first part is the Apple menu, which is indicated by this Apple symbol in the corner. Then you have application menus, and these change depending on the application that you're currently running and have to the forefront. Now, currently, I have Finder running. The desktop itself is part of Finder. It's actually a folder uh, within Finder. Uh, then you have menu bar items. Now, these are small, normally status indicators that are placed in the menu bar by either third-party applications or by some of Apple's own applications built into OS X. Um, also, we have a thing called Spotlight right at the end. And that's the system-wide search provided by OS X. But let's first have a look at all these individually. Let's have a look at the Apple menu. Now, because the menu bar is on the top of your primary display at all times, this Apple menu is also available at all times. And it allows you to access information about your Mac and also to do some common tasks as well. So for instance, uh, if we click on About This Mac, that will give us a quick update as to what software version we're running, what the processor is, what the memory is, etc. Uh, we can also have a look at a more info application. And this gives us an overview of our system, tells us what displays we're running, uh, tells us what storage we have, and also the memory. 
we close that down, go back to the Apple menu. Uh, we can also run software update. Now software update is an automated mechanism that goes ahead and checks the Apple servers to see whether or not there are any software updates available for this particular machine, uh, both for OS X, but also for any applications that you've installed uh, externally from the Mac App Store. Then you can also access the Mac App Store. Uh, we'll look at the Mac App Store later. Uh, access system preferences, and this takes us to our uh, now familiar system preferences pane or panel. Let's close that down. Uh, we can also here get to the dock and configure the dock. Uh, we can get to recent items, so all the applications that we've run recently, and also any documents that we've had access to recently as well. Uh, an option to force quit. Uh, again, another myth to dispel in that Macs are always 100% uh, up and running. We do get the occasional rogue application that you need to force quit out of. Uh, similar to the control Alt delete within Windows, we can go into force quit. Here you can see there is a keyboard shortcut, which is Alt, Command, and escape. If I just click on that entry, it takes us to this force quit applications dialog. And normally from within here, we can see any misbehaving applications. Uh, select an application. Let's uh, force quit text edit, although it's not misbehaving at the moment, but we'll just say force quit and say force quit again, and that will close the application down. Something you don't have to do that often, but it's nice to know that it's available from the Apple menu when you do need it. The next section allows you to put your machine to sleep, to restart your machine, or to completely shut down the machine uh, prior to actually powering it down. And then finally, options to log out of this particular user account. So that's the Apple menu. As I say, that's always available because the menu bar is always at the top of your primary display. Now, the next section on the menu bar are your application menus. Uh, usually, you'll find the application name is in bold. And then within there, there are certain standards that Apple developers work to. So there's normally an about uh, menu item, an option to get into the application preferences, and then some more specific things to do with that particular application. And then the additional menus uh, will change depending on the type of application you run. So we have a file menu uh, allowing you to uh, create new finder windows to get info. We have an edit menu, a view menu, uh, a go menu, window, and help. And we'll look at these in more detail when we look at the finder. Uh, if I go down to the dock, and let's open up Safari, which is the browser. Okay, that will load Safari, but you'll notice in the menu bar, the menu items have changed. So Safari is now the frontmost application. So we have uh, Safari in bold, and again, about Safari, access to preferences, and some other specific Safari uh, menu items. A file menu, an edit menu, and a view. Now these all change dependent on what you can do within the application. But all applications tend to have the same sort of menu, so a file menu, an edit menu, uh, view, window, and then help at the end as well. Now, the help feature in OS X line has been updated, and it's very useful. Uh, it enables you to find hidden menu items that perhaps you don't know where they are. So, uh, for instance, under bookmarks, there is an option to add to reading list. But if I didn't know where that was, I could just go straight to help, uh, go to the search field, and just start typing in, so reading list. Okay, so there are all my menu items. Uh, the neat thing is, as I go down and scroll through the list using my arrow keys, you'll see the menu will pop up, and we'll get this little blue indicator showing where they are located on the menus. Very neat. Let me just escape from that and escape again. Well, well let me leave Safari open and open another application uh, to bring to the forefront. Let's say Calculator. Okay, so here's my calculator, and you'll see that the menu has now changed for all the menu items connected with the calculator. And if I close that down, back to Safari, close Safari down, and click on the desktop, and back to the finder. The menu items on the right-hand side of the menu bar will probably look completely different on your machine because it does depend on what applications you have installed and are running, and also how your machine is configured. So, for instance, here I've got, uh, well, the first icon is Pinpoint. That's the application I'm using to highlight my mouse cursor. I can control that from the menu bar. Uh, the next one is ScreenFlow. Again, the uh, little symbol with the dot just indicates that I'm recording. So it's a good visual reminder to me that I've actually pressed record on my recording session. Uh, the next one is Time Machine. Now, that's grayed out at the moment. Now, Time Machine is the built-in mechanism 
within both Snow Leopard and Lion that allows you to back up your machine to an external drive. Uh, definitely something we need to cover in this particular tutorial. Now, the next one is an indication of my Bluetooth status. I have my Wi-Fi status. I have a sound control, so I can control my sound from here as well. Uh, this is the mechanism that allowed me to view the on-screen keyboard before. Uh, also, my status of my battery charging, currently logged on a screencast online, and then this last one here is Spotlight. As well as giving you the visual indicator from the menu bar item itself, you can normally click on these things to get more information. So that's my current Bluetooth status, my current Wi-Fi status. Uh, we've seen the sound module. Uh, this is the character viewer and my battery status. Uh, you can get additional information though by holding down the Alt key. So for instance, if I go to my Wi-Fi status and click on the Wi-Fi status, you'll see what networks are available. Uh, it's looking for networks. In addition, you can also get down to open network preferences uh, within the system preferences panel. If I click away and then hold down the Alt key and then click on the same menu item, you'll see we get much more information. Uh, we get some uh, information about the particular network that we're connected to via Wi-Fi. And that's true for most of these uh, menu bar items. So again, Bluetooth, we get some summary information. Click away, hold down the Alt key, click again, we get some more detailed information. Uh, if you don't want these to appear in your menu bar, they usually are configurable through the System Preferences pane. And you can get to the System Preferences pane from the menu bar item. So let's say we wanted to take the Bluetooth indicator out of our menu bar item. If I click, we'll see down here, here we go, Open Bluetooth Preferences. If I select that, okay, I've disconnected the trackpad, by the way, because of the, uh, the battery issues I was having earlier in the tutorial. I must find some new extra batteries, but for now I've disconnected it. Um, but what I want to do is take this option off here, show Bluetooth status in the menu bar. We'll uncheck that and you'll see that that has now disappeared. I close that down. Uh, we can also do a similar thing for the character viewer by open keyboard preferences. There we go, show keyboard and character viewers in the menu bar. Uncheck that and we'll close that down. And now open language and text preferences. And again, show input menu, menu bar, deselect. Okay, so we can have some control over how we have the menu items uh, appearing in the menu bar. This last option here, which gives us our login, uh, is to do with fast user switching. It is possible to have multiple accounts set up on your Mac and then switch quickly between them, which is great in a family environment. You can have separate user accounts for different members of the family, and then dependent on who is logged in at the time, have them appear in the menu bar. But we'll look at that when we look at accounts. One additional item you might want in your menu bar is to have the date and time displayed. Uh, we can do that through system preferences. This time I'll go to the Apple menu, select system preferences. One of the problems with system preferences is that it's sometimes difficult to identify the section you need to go into to configure a certain thing. Now for date and time, it's quite easy. There is an option here for date and time, but even when you know what the option is called, it's sometimes difficult to spot it with all these different icons. Uh, I can actually see date and time is down here. So I could click on there, but one of the things you might want to do uh, while you're still getting used to your Mac is to use this search feature within system preferences. So if I type date, uh, two things happen. One, it starts to uh, highlight those elements or those icons within system preferences that do relate to date and time. So it's picked up date and time. It's also found language and text as well because there's some formatting things we can do with date and time. But also from the search panel, we have these options here. So date and time, set date and time. So if you need to change the date and time, that's the one we want to show date and time in the menu bar. So if I select that, there we go. So what I can do now is go to show date and time and menu bar, options for digital or analog. You'll see it changes. We'll leave it with digital. Uh, I could even uh, announce the time on the hour by using the inbuilt voices, but I don't think we'll do that. So uh, all I would need to do now is just close down system preferences and we have our date and time in the menu bar. Um, what I think I will do though is take that off. So let me go back into it and switch that off. Uh, it just helps keeping the continuity of the recording together if I don't show the date and time. Okay, let's take a quick look at Spotlight. 
Spotlight is a very powerful system-wide search mechanism that allows you to find, well, pretty much anything that you have on your Mac. Uh, two different ways to invoke it. We can either go up into the menu bar and use the Spotlight icon, click on it to bring up the Spotlight search panel, or there is a keyboard shortcut. Uh, by default, it's Command and Spacebar, and again, that will bring up the Spotlight search panel. Uh, let's say I wanted to search on my Mac for anything related to Apple. Uh, not necessarily just on my Mac. You'll see as I enter the search term, we do get options to go to the web to do searches as well. But let me just type in Apple. As I start typing, you'll see the list is being refined. Okay, so I can show all the results in Finder. Let's leave that for now. The top hit is the Apple Script Editor, which is an application installed on the system. Now, as well as the Apple Script Editor, there's also an applet launcher and also text edit. Uh, there's options to go to system preference options for sharing and for users and groups. There are some messages. So these are email messages. Uh, I'll show you how to set up email shortly, but these are email messages that have Apple uh, within the email itself. And you'll notice as well that as I move between each entry, it actually displays the content, uh, in this case, of the email message for each uh, result that it's found. It's also found some web pages in my Safari history, Safari being the web browser. So, and again, it even goes away and renders the page for us so we can see the content. So there's my one Apple page, um, that's the same Apple page, and then the Apple start page. It's found some fonts, so uh, we can even see the fonts through Quick Look. Look up Apple in the dictionary, and we can even do web searches. Search the web for Apple, or search Wikipedia for Apple. Now, had this been my normal production machine, I probably would have had a lot more documents. Uh, and again, the documents would have appeared within this list as well. Uh, you can configure what Spotlight searches on your Mac by going into Spotlight Preferences. So if I select Spotlight Preferences, so we can rearrange the order in which the results appear within our Spotlight Results panel by dragging and dropping. And we can also use these checkboxes to enable or disable searching on these different categories. If you do want to change the keyboard shortcuts, uh, we can change them down here. So the Spotlight menu keyboard shortcut, as I mentioned before, is Command Space. You can change that if you want to. And also the Spotlight window keyboard shortcut for your results. Now, if you have external drives connected um, or there are areas on your Mac that you don't want Spotlight to index, you can enter those under this privacy section. So either click the Add button or drag a folder or disk into the list below. Now, if I just close that down, and let's go back into our search panel. So command spacebar, uh, it's remembered that particular search command. If I actually want to open something now, all I need to do is go down, let's say open the Apple web page, just hit return, and that will open Safari and take me straight to that page. And let me close Safari down again. I can either uh, close it by this red uh, indicator in the traffic lights, or I can do a command Q and that will close that down for me. Okay, let's do uh, another search. One thing that Spotlight is used a lot for is for application launching. So for instance, if I wanted to use the calculator, uh, I could either go down to the dock, I could go into Launchpad, or I can do Command Space, type in C-A-L, and that brings up both iCal, the calendar application, but also the calculator. So I can select calculator, hit return, and that will load the application for me. To close it down, I'll just do a command Q. Using Spotlight as an application launcher does have some limitations. And as you saw before, when I typed Cal, C-A-L, it didn't bring me my calculator, it brought iCal. But if I just finish off with a C, it will actually bring calculator to the forefront. Um, also, it doesn't support abbreviations or it doesn't support uh, initials. So for instance, if I wanted to load disk utility, I can't just type D-U, that won't find it for me. I have to type D-I-S-K, and then it finds disk utility. There are some third-party uh, application launchers that are a lot more sophisticated, but of course the benefit of using Spotlight is that it's built into every Mac. Now, just as a slight aside, if I go back into Safari, now I have been mentioning using Command Q to close down the application. Command Q is the command to quit the application, so that will actually stop Safari running. If I wanted just to close the window, I can use Command W, and that will close the window down, and then Command Q, to close Safari down. But we'll look at window handling in a bit more detail in a later module. For this next section, we'll take a look at the desktop itself. Now, the desktop in OS X is actually a folder. 
so you can place things on the desktop. But the thing that people tend to want to do first when they get a new Mac is to customize the desktop and possibly change the desktop wallpaper. Now to do that, all you need to do is go into System Preferences. And again, there are several ways of doing that. Let's go ahead and use Spotlight to do that using the application launching. I know that within System Preferences that there is an option called Desktop. So if I do Command Space and just start typing in Desktop, you see the top hit is Desktop and Screensaver. I'll just hit Return. And there's my Desktop Configuration Panel. Now a couple of things, I can change the Desktop Picture. So we have some pre-selected pictures here that Apple have provided. Let's go back to Andromeda. Uh, I can select solid colors. So I just want to play in background. But again, back to Andromeda. Uh, I can also add additional folders. Now I can access my pictures folders. Uh, there are no pictures in there at the moment. Or if I already have a folder of desktop pictures that I want to use, I can just hit the plus button and navigate through and find those. But for now, I'll just say cancel. Now it's also possible to change your picture every 30 minutes, select a random order. Um, but again, it's a bit too distracting, so I tend to leave mine on a single desktop image. The only other option you have here is the translucent menu bar. Now you'll notice the menu bar up at the top. You can actually see through and see some of the star fields behind the menu bar. I can take that off, and we now get a perfectly solid menu bar. Click it again, and it goes back to translucent. Now there is also a screensaver option. In fact, there are multiple screensavers. Uh, do all sorts of things. You can sample them from here if you want. Uh, arabesque, computer name, flurry. Uh, iTunes artwork is very good. Now, because this is a demo machine, I haven't started to populate my iTunes library. But this screensaver will give you a mosaic of your iTunes library, all the album art. And you can actually play them from the screensaver as well. So if an album comes up that you haven't heard for a while, uh, while the screensaver is on, you can actually click on the album artwork and it will start playing for you. And lots of others to explore as well. To configure when the screensaver kicks in, you just go down to this slider here and change the options for when you want it to appear. Now in this case, you can see I've set it to 15 minutes and the display will sleep before my screensaver activates. Uh, there is another option called Energy Saver Preferences. If I just click on that link, and using this option, you can configure your computer to go to sleep after a predetermined time. You can also set your display to go to sleep after a predetermined time, uh, put your hard disks to sleep when possible, allow the machine to wake up for Wi-Fi network access, and for a laptop to automatically reduce brightness before the display goes to sleep. Uh, one new feature in line is the ability to restart automatically if the computer freezes, so I'll select that. So to get rid of the error message that we had before, if I put my computer sleep to be one hour, say OK, and also my display sleep to be one hour, because this is a machine I use quite frequently. Let's go back. There, my screensaver now will kick in after 15 minutes, and then after an hour, my machine will then go to sleep. If you want your screensaver to kick in uh, on demand, you can actually set up hot corners. So if I click on hot corners, uh, let's say the bottom right-hand corner, if I want to put my display to sleep, I can select that, I'll say OK. And now when I go down to the bottom right hand corner, uh, I won't actually do it because it will ruin my recording. That will put the display to sleep. Uh, just a tap and it will come back up again. As well as putting your display to sleep using a hot corner and by putting it to sleep, it will just give you a blank sort of dead screen. Uh, you might want to switch on your screen saver. And again, you can do that from a hot corner. If I go back into hot corners and this time for the upper right, uh, you can start screen saver. And uh, basically, you might have your screen server. You might want your iTunes library to be displayed. You might want to have the RSS feed screen reader so that there's always something on the screen. But uh, you can select that and say OK. And now you can either put the display to sleep from the bottom right corner or bring up the screen saver using the top right hand corner. One thing to bear in mind with sleep, and uh, this is a security aspect, you might want to set it so that whenever your machine does go to sleep, it prompts you for your password when you log back in. Uh, this is useful if you do leave your desktop or your laptop unattended. Uh, once the screensaver kicks in or once the machine goes to sleep, when you wake it, it's best practice to ask your machine to prompt you for your password again so that no unauthorized users can use your machine. Um, to do that, well, let's do it from, from here. If I just type in security at the top, so we want security settings. Okay, so by default, it's requiring a password immediately after sleep or screensaver begins. Uh, you can switch that off if you want, or you can set up a time delay 
or when the password will be required, but uh, normally best to leave that to immediately. Let's take a look at how we can manage uh, files and folders when we do place them on the desktop. Now, my particular desktop on this system is clean. There are no icons on there, there are no files or folders, but some people do like to keep things on the desktop for easy retrieval. And as I mentioned before, the desktop really is just another folder within your file system. Now, if we go across to the Finder, I've actually got my Documents folder open, and in here there are several different types of documents. Uh, I can drag these out if I want to, so if I can just drag that PDF off to the desktop, um, or I can drag them using the Finder itself. Now, we'll look at the Finder in more detail uh, later on in the tutorial. But basically, if I want to move all these documents to my desktop, uh, I can either do them one by one, I can select them by sort of drawing around using the mouse, or I can do Command A, which is a select all command. Once I have all the documents selected, I can just drag them across, well, either to the desktop, I can just jump on the desktop, or because it is a folder within the Finder, there's also a representation here. So desktop, drop them there, and you'll see they appear both in the Finder, but also on my desktop surface. Let's pop the Finder away, and let's continue working with the desktop. Well, now that we have our files on the desktop, we can start to change the view options to view them slightly differently. So if I control or right click on the desktop, you'll see we have a show view options. I should point out as well that all these are things I'm showing you on the desktop, you can do this within the Finder as well. So you can do this on a folder by folder basis within the Finder. Um, but uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's say increase the icon size. If I just change the slider, you'll see the icons start to get bigger to a maximum of 128 by 128. Now I have this option here to show icon preview switched on. If we switch that off, we remove the preview and switch it back on again, much more useful. Now, let's change the icon size back down to something a bit more manageable. In fact, let's make it slightly smaller than you might do normally. Okay, uh, now we can alter the grid spacing. So I can actually move the spacing between the various icons. Uh, I can change the text size go down to 10 or increase the text size up to 16. Let's put it back to 11. The positioning of the textual labels, so on the right hand side or at the bottom, and then an option to show item info. Uh, you'll notice that uh, it's a little bit crushed. The info is such things as the file size, also the resolution of these images. Uh, what we can do to sort that out, if we just go along to here and say clean up, that will just refresh the screen and uh, replace the icons in a more optimum layout. Now we can also sort from the view options, but you can also sort from the desktop itself. If I right click on the desktop, uh, let's say sort by, and go to, um, well, let's say name. Okay, that will just uh, resort by name. There's also an option to clean up by, which enables you to temporarily sort them by these different parameters as well. So say for instance, size. Uh, but let's go back and uh, sort by kind. Okay, so we have our images together, we have our PDFs together, uh, our keynotes together, etc. Now, while we're looking at PDFs, one other thing to show you as well, if I go back into show view options and uh, make these icons bigger, you'll notice that we can page through the individual pages of each PDF using the arrows directly from the icon. Uh, an even better thing though is a thing called Quick Look. Built into Line is an option to view uh, your files without having to open the application that supports them. So for instance, I have this PDF highlighted. In fact, let me highlight this one here. This is a, a landscape version. So if I just hit the space bar, you'll see Quick Look opens the uh, PDF. In the sidebar, we have some thumbnails, so I can page through. Uh, if I wanted to, I could actually open this with Preview itself. So that will open the application for me. But uh, we'll look at Preview at a later time. Again, exactly the same with images. I can highlight the image, hit spacebar, and that will pop it up for me. Uh, if you have multiple applications installed on your system that supports uh, this JPEG file format, um, they will actually appear in this list. So if I click and hold, you'll see Preview is the default application. I have two other applications. If you had other applications that support JPEG, they would appear in this list as well. But uh, that's just a quick tip on using Quick Look from the desktop. But again, you can use that from any folder from within the Finder. Let's close view options down. You might have noticed as well that if we go into this context menu, 
by right clicking on the desktop, we can change the desktop background directly from this menu as well. It takes us straight back into the preferences pane for desktop and screensaver. Okay, let's close that down. Now let's finish off by tidying up my desktop. Let me go back into the finder. Okay, so these are all my desktop files. Again, I'll select them all, Command A, and then I'll just drag them and drop them into my documents folder. Okay, and again, if I control or right click, I've got the same options here to clean up, also to uh, change the arrangement. Okay, and I'll close the Finder down. One other option is within Finder Preferences. If I go to Preferences, you'll see under General, we have the option to show uh, additional items on the desktop, such as the hard disks installed within your machine, any external disks or drives that you connect, CDs, DVDs, and iPods, and also any connected servers. So if you're on a network of Macs, you can actually connect to other Macs and then see them on your desktop. So this sort of enables you, if I just close Preferences down, uh, this is my hard disk on my MacBook Air. I can double click on the hard disk and get direct access to the Finder through that way. Let me just connect a USB drive, show you that appearing on the desktop. And there's my USB drive. Double click, and that's the contents. Uh, just one thing to point out about connecting USB drives or external drives to your Mac, you do need to eject them from the system before removing them physically. So if I control or right click, just say eject USB drive. Okay, that's now ejected so I can remove that from a Mac quite safely. Now let's go back into Finder Preferences. And because I like a nice clean desktop, I'm actually gonna take those all off. And that's the desktop within Mac OS X. One of the benefits of using a Mac is that there's a wealth of beautifully written and very useful software available for download and installation. Apple have made the installation process much, much simpler with the introduction of the Mac App Store. Now to get to the Mac App Store, all you need to do, well, several ways as usual. We can go down to the dock, and if you have the App Store installed in your dock, you can click from here or command space and just type APP, and that will bring the App Store in your spotlight list. Let's just hit return to run it. Now the App Store is a service run by Apple that allows you to search for and purchase the latest and greatest software applications. Now it's not the only source of software for the Mac, but I have to say that it's the easiest to use. Uh, everything is automated for you. Uh, basically once you've found your software, the App Store will install it for you automatically directly onto your Mac. Now there are other sources of software. You can go to third party software vendors. They will normally allow you to purchase and download software directly from their website. And I'll show you a couple of the other ways that you can install software on the Mac. But the easiest way, to be honest, is to go to the Mac App Store. Now when you do arrive at the Mac App Store, uh, various ways to search for software. You'll see across the top there are some icons. So currently we're on the featured page. And here we can see new and noteworthy software titles. Uh, we can see various categories here, such as games, Lion, uh, apps enhanced for Lion, and down at the bottom, what's hot. Uh, over in the side panel, if we scroll up to the top, we have some quick links, uh, categories. So if you want to search for a particular category of application, let's say you wanted to find some productivity apps, you can just uh, click on the drop down menu, click on productivity, and that will take you to the productivity section. So some apps across the top and some selected apps in this panel. You can see all by clicking on the see all button and that will show you all the productivity apps. Let's just go back a level. Um, also, you do have options in the side panel, such as the top paid apps, the top free apps. Not all applications on the App Store are purchasable. Some of them are free. So you can check out the free apps. And also there's a section here for top grossing. Now this is specific to the productivity category. Um, rather than top grossing of all. Uh, if you want to see all, if we go to featured and then scroll down, you'll see top paid, top free, and top grossing for all applications. Now to purchase an app from the App Store, you will need an Apple ID. Now, if you already have used the iTunes Store, say for instance, on your iPhone or your iPad, you can use the same Apple ID. If you've never used one before, what you can do is to sign in and then using this button here, you can create a new Apple ID. Now, if you already have an Apple ID for your iCloud account, 
and we'll have a look at iCloud separately. Uh, what I would recommend is that you don't use the same Apple ID that you used for your iCloud account. I would be inclined to create a separate Apple ID for the App Store. Uh, I already have an Apple ID though, so I'm going to go ahead and enter mine so we can log in and install an application. Enter our password and sign in. Now, once you're signed into your account, you'll notice, for instance, here I have an application that I've previously installed on another Mac. And one nice thing about the App Store is that uh, once you've purchased some applications or downloaded an application from the App Store, if you have other Macs, you can then download that same application onto the other Mac. So if you have a, a desktop and a laptop, you can share the software between those two devices uh, just as long as you use the same Apple ID. So let me go ahead and uh, let's install this uh, mental case. Okay, and there we go. So basically the App Store has downloaded the application and installed it into Launchpad. If we just hit Escape. Now to get back to Launchpad, you can use the specific keyboard key. On this machine, it's F4. And that takes us back to Launchpad. I escape from there. Or if we go into the dock, you'll see there's an icon in the dock for Launchpad as well. Once you've purchased a few applications, if you go to the Purchase tab, you'll see a list of all the applications that you've previously purchased and can now install on this particular machine. So I've already installed Mental Case. I've got some other options here to install desktop shelves. QR encoder, Grandview, etc. I've also got access to some Apple software, GarageBand, iMovie, and iPhoto. There are some updates available. I could hit accept at this point and they would be installed on this machine. Now, if you want to hide purchases, say it's a software application that you've installed previously, but you don't really want to use it, uh, you can go down here and as you go over each item, you'll see this little X and click on the X and that will hide it from your purchase list. And finally, for the Mac App Store, if you go to the Updates tab, uh, this will show a list of any applications that have new updates. So as you can see, all apps are currently up to date, so there's no updates to download. But uh, normally, if there are updates, you'll get a badge icon against this tab. You can go into this particular tab and download them directly. OK, let's go across to another website and look at a different way of installing applications. There are two applications I'd recommend installing on any new Mac. One is a thing called WMA Player for Mac, which will allow you to play Windows media content. And the other one is a thing called Perian that allows you to install some additional software that will help with playing different types of videos. And they actually don't use the Mac App Store. They have to be downloaded and installed separately. So the first thing we need to do is to find the software. So to do that, I'm going to go onto the internet and I'm going to use Safari. So I'll just click on Safari in the dock. Now, Safari is the web browser that is supplied with Mac OS X. Uh, currently it's set up for apple.com as the start page. I'll include a separate section about using Safari. But what I'll do is go to my search panel and just type in a search term, which will be WMA Player. And you can see there, there's the first result. I want WMA Player for Mac. Hit return and that will do a Google search. And it's this first option here. If I click on the, okay, Windows Media Components for QuickTime. It's a free download. So I'll click on this tab. Okay, and there's my download link. So let me just go ahead and download. Now you might have noticed a slight animation. Uh, the downloaded file has popped into Safari. This will show the downloads, this button. And there it is there. So this is Flip for Mac WMV. 2.4.0.11.dmg. Now the DMG extension is called a disk image file. So it's a special type of file that uh, some software applications are packaged in uh, that are delivered in this disk image format. Now we should be able to just double click on this entry and the file should open. Now let me just minimize Safari. And there we have the disk image file that has been opened. Inside the disk image file, is this mpkg file. This is a package file. And again, this is a special type of file that uh, is called an application package. And what we need to do to install this is to double click the package file and that will run an installation routine. Okay, I'll just uh, minimize that as well. Okay, this package will run a software program to determine if the software can be installed. We'll say continue. Uh, an introduction, again, continue. A readme file, I'm just gonna go and continue 
and then continue again. There is a license agreement. You can read the license agreement or just go ahead and agree. And then install. You do need to enter your admin password. We're going to install the software and that's it. As you can see, a lot more complex than the Mac App Store, but you will come across this uh, particular technique several times if you try and install some third party software. Uh, they do prompt you to upgrade, but there's no real need if you're not a professional video uh, editor. So we'll say continue. The installation was successful. The software was installed and close. Okay, so that's now installed. Uh, one other thing to point out to you, if I just move this window, uh, if we scroll down to the bottom, you'll see, and I'll just widen the sidebar. Under devices, we have this flip for Mac WMV 24011. This is the disk image file that has been opened, but we can now close the disk image file and get rid of it. So if I just click on this symbol here, that will unmount the disk image. Then if I go to my downloads folder, okay, there's the disk image file there. We can either keep this if there's anything else in there that we want, or I can just delete it. Now to delete, I just highlight the file and do command backspace, and that will send it across to my trash. So that's one way to install software using a disk image file. Uh, the other software that I wanted to show you, uh, if we go back to Safari, and I'll show you another trick now, Safari is still running in the background. So if I do command and tab, you'll see we get a list of all the different applications that are still running. So I have Safari, uh, ScreenFlow, which is my uh, video capture application that I'm recording the screencast on. We have the App Store. And we also have Finder. So just command and tab to highlight Safari. Now, because it's minimized, all I need to do is hold down the Alt or Option key, and then release, and that will bring it back for me. Okay, let's clear my downloads queue. And this time, let's search for the other piece of software, which is Perian. Hit return, okay. And again, top result, Perian, the Swiss army knife of QuickTime components. So it's a free open source QuickTime package that adds native support for many popular video formats. Very, very useful. So there is a download button here, or rather a download link. I'll click on the download link. Again, we get the animation. It uh, goes into the download queue. If we click on here. It's another disk image file. So if I double click the disk image file, that will open the disk image file and mount it. That's another term you might be familiar with. Okay, uh, I can see in the background behind Safari, if I just pop Safari down. Okay, this is a, another type of installation. This time it's a preference pane. So this will end up in our system preferences panel. And to install, all I need to do is just double click this icon here. I can either install for this user only or install for all users of this computer. Uh, I'm gonna say install for all users of the computer. We'll say install, again, admin password. And we'll say okay. And once more. Say OK. Now, this is just an additional component within Perian that is going to go ahead and check for any updates. Uh, we know we've just downloaded it from the internet, so we're fine with that. So I'll say Open. OK, and it's now installed. And basically, that's it. So I can close this down. I can close this disk image file down. I can go back to Finder. So Command and Tab, Find Finder, hold down the Alt or Option key and release. And then down at the bottom of my sidebar, there is the Perian disk image. I can eject that. Go back to my downloads folder. There's the disk image file. Command backspace, and that's now deleted. Now these are some other things I've installed previously. So I can highlight the first one, hold down the shift key, highlight the second one. Command backspace, and they're now deleted as well, or rather in the trash. And let's minimize the finder. Now there's one other type of uh, software package that you might come across when you're installing software from third parties, and that's the zip archive format. So again, if I go back across to Safari, so Command Tab, hold down the Alt key, let's clear my download list, go to the search panel, and I'll search for, uh, let me search for a thing called Dash Cards. Dash Cards are a free service that allow you to download, in effect, crib sheets for different keyboard combinations and the crib sheets get installed in your dashboard. Now, dashboard we haven't touched on before, but dashboard is a separate part of the Mac 
uh, that allows you to uh, install these small little programs called widgets. Now you can get to the dashboard uh, several ways. We'll look at dashboard more when we look at mission control, but uh, in this configuration with my gestures enabled, if I do a four finger swipe to the right, you'll see this is my dashboard and there are currently four widgets installed in there. As I say, we'll look more at the dashboard later, but let me just uh, do a four finger swipe back to the left and I'm back at uh, Safari. So if I now just type, I hit return, this is the first hit. So I'll just click on the top link. So we'll go over to dashcards.com. And if I scroll down here, these are all the different crib sheets available. There's one for Mac OS 10 general. So we could install this and use it as a sort of like a, a crib sheet to check on our keyboard shortcuts. So I'm going to click on that icon. I'm going to click the download link. Again, animation goes across. This time, because it's a zip file, uh, Safari is configured to open known files. So do we want to install the dash cards widget and open it in dashboard? Let me cancel this because I'm going to do it manually rather than automatically. If I go across to the downloads queue, in fact, let's open it up in Finder. Yeah, let me just show you this. It's actually opened the zip file and extracted dash cards from it. I'm going to delete that. I'm going to go back to Safari and in Safari, I'm going to go to preferences. And this option here, open safe files after downloading, I'm going to uncheck. Um, this might be useful for you if you're not happy that uh, certain files will be opened automatically for you. You can take that setting off. So if I close that down again, let's clear my downloads link. You don't need to clear down this list, by the way, every time. Uh, I'm just doing it for clarity. Let's go back to download and re-download that particular package. Okay, this time nothing has happened. So if I go to my list, you'll see we have here dash cards zip. Let me hit the magnifying glass and go straight there in the finder. You'll see dash cards dot zip. If I double click that file, right, it's extracted the contents of the zip file into finder. It's called dash cards. This is actually a widget. Uh, widgets are things that run in your dashboard. So what I'm going to do is double click on the widget. Right, do we want to install the dash cards widget and open it in dashboard? We'll say install. And we'll say keep. Let me just uh, move this down. Uh, this is a great free utility that enables you to have a look at various keyboard shortcuts. Uh, let me select from this list the OS 10 general. Again, reposition the window. I've now got a crib sheet for all my uh, keyboard shortcuts. Okay, and I'll just do a four finger swipe to get back to my main desktop. And we're there. So again, I'll now highlight the zip file in my downloads folder, command backspace, and that's now moved to the trash. Close the finder down. And one final example of installing, this time just a normal application that's delivered via a zip file. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go across to, uh, or rather I'm going to search for NVAlt, which is uh, one of my favorite sort of text editors. Here it is, NVAlt. Again, free application, uh, supports things such as Markdown. Um, for information about Markdown, in fact, for information about any of the applications, my favorite applications, I tend to cover them in my weekly screencast over at screencastonline.com. But if we go to download for this, again, we should see the animation drops into my downloads folder. If we open up Finder using the magnifying glass, there's a zip file. Again, I've got safe mode off, so it won't unpack the zip file for me. But if I double click the zip file, it will extract the zip file and there's the application. Now, a couple of things. If the application is delivered in a disk image file, I mean, you could actually run the application from the disk image file itself. The only problem is you'll probably unmount the disk image and then the next time you go to run the application, it's disappeared and you'll wonder where it's gone. So what you have to do once you've actually unzipped or uh, opened up uh, a disk image file is to drag the application across to the applications folder. And that's now installed. So I can get rid of this again, command backspace and that's now gone. So now if I go across to my applications folder, you should see there it is, NVAlt is in there. But also if I go into Launchpad, I'll use F4 to launch Launchpad. This is the first page. I'll just do a two finger swipe to the left. And there's my 
manually installed application along with all the other applications that I installed before. So just escape and back out of Launchpad. So that's uh, several of the most common ways of installing software. Let's see how we uninstall software. There are two different ways of uninstalling software, and it really depends on how the software was originally installed that determines which technique that you use. Now you can uninstall directly from Launchpad for those applications that have been installed via the Mac App Store. So if we go into Launchpad, you'll see I have a number of applications, but I don't really know which ones I've actually installed via the Mac App Store, so how do I tell? Well, all you need to do is uh, from within Launchpad, just select an icon and then click and hold and uh, we then go into this, uh, what I call a jiggle mode. Now this is directly taken from iOS 5. For those icons that were installed via the Mac App Store, you'll see that we have these X's next to them. So Pinpoint and Mental Case were both installed from the Mac App Store. So consequently, we can uninstall them from Launchpad. And to uninstall, it's really just a matter of just clicking the X and then confirming the deletion. Uh, these other applications were installed externally from the Mac App Store, so there's a different way that we uninstall those. To uninstall these applications, if we hit Escape once, that takes us out of Jiggle mode. And Escape again takes us back to the desktop. Uh, let's launch the Finder. And then from within the Finder, we'll go to the Applications folder. Now to delete an application from the Applications folder, let's say this NV Alt, if we highlight the icon, and then Command and Backspace, that's now deleted. And basically that's all there is. You might find occasionally, if you install a, a large and complex application through an installation package, there may be an uninstall routine you have to run. But for 98% of all applications that you'll install externally from the Mac App Store, just simply deleting them from the Applications folder is sufficient. Uh, there are some third-party applications, such as App Zapper, which will do a similar job for you and also clean up for you as well. But uh, in most cases, just a simple command and backspace from the Applications folder will uninstall the application for you. One of the most important applications within OS X Line is the Finder, and we've touched on it before, but this section will just give you an introduction to some of the functions of the Finder. To get more information and to delve a bit more deeply into both the Finder and also some other aspects of Line, you need to check out the companion tutorial to this tutorial, which is called SEO Tutor for Lion, which is now available on the Mac App Store. But uh, let's have a quick look at the Finder. So if I go down to the dock and open a new Finder window, there are three main parts to the Finder. There's the toolbar across the top, there's the sidebar, and then there is the file display area. There are several different views that you can apply to your files. Now, this is the uh, icon view where each file is represented as a full-blown icon. There's a list view, so we can see a list with columns, so the file name, the kind, uh, when it was last opened in this particular view. There's also a column view, allowing us to see the files in a series of columns. This particular one has a preview mode as well, and there's a thing called cover flow view. Now this is a view that has a representation of the files in graphical form at the top. So we can use this uh, cover flow carousel type view to look at the files, and then we have the list of files at the bottom. If I just go back to icon view, what I would suggest is that you go to View and Show Status Bar. And then down in the status bar, we have this slider. And this allows us to actually make the icons much larger. So in this view, we can see large scale representations of the files right up to 512 by 512 resolution. Uh, you can even read the PDF files that are displayed in this icon view. Now this is useful if you have a folder full of images and you want to actually have a look at all the images, you can scale them up using this slider or scale them down to a more reasonable level to see more on the page. Now this particular view is looking at all my files. This is a new view within Lion that allows you to see all your recent documents and they can be sorted by different categories. So for instance, we have images, we have PDF documents, presentations, spreadsheets, and normal documents down at the bottom. And each one of these you can use a gesture to scroll backwards and forwards through to have a look at your files. If you want to change the item arrangement, you can click on this button. Uh, say you want to sort by application, and that will show you the different applications that the files belong to. So for instance, these files can be opened in preview, and these files can be opened in ScreenFlow. Other options to sort by date, 
uh, by size and by label. Let's go back to kind. Let's scroll back to the top and have a look at some of the other features within the sidebar. Now there is a separate favorites panel. Now these can all be hidden or shown again by clicking on the hide or show label that appears when you hover your mouse over the section label. Uh, we've had a look at all my files. There's a new feature within OS 10 line called AirDrop. Now this is a new technology that allows you to connect to uh, local Macs and share files between them. Now each Mac needs to have AirDrop or Lion installed and have a relatively new Wi-Fi card. There's the Applications folder, uh, access to your desktop, access to your documents, a Downloads folder, a Movies folder, Music, Pictures. And this is one that I've added in. This is a separate folder that I'm using for my video capture. Now you can control what is included or excluded from this favorite section by going to Finder Preferences, and then under Sidebar. So now if you want to remove a folder, say your music folder, you can uncheck. If I want to add my home folder, I will just check that. There's also a shared section to look at Back to My Mac. Back to My Mac are machines that are connected via iCloud that you can access remotely, uh, connected servers, and also local computers on the local Bonjour network. In addition, there's a devices section. You can add your own machine in, have your hard disks shown, your external disks, iDisk if you have a mobile me account, and then access to CDs, DVDs, and iPods as well. So now if we close down the preferences, I now have access to my home folder and also to my computer. And under my computer, I have a remote disk access, my hard drive, and access to the network. Just to go back to the favorite section, uh, when OS X creates an account for you to use your Mac, it creates a number of folders. Uh, the first one is the home folder. So you'll see here, this is my home folder, Screencasts Online. And that actually contains all these other folders that are also displayed within the favorites section. So desktop, documents, downloads, movies, pictures. So these are all contained within my home folder, and these are created to help you organize your files. It's very simple to create your own files if you want to extend your folders. All you need to do is go to the File menu, and then you can say New Folder, or use the shortcut key Shift-Command-N. Let's just go ahead and create a new folder. So that's created a new Untitled folder, and the Untitled folder part is already highlighted, so I can now rename that folder just by typing. So let's call this PDF Docs. To add this folder to my favorite section, it's simply just a matter of dragging and then dropping. So let's uh, drop it just above my Home folder and underneath Capture. To move files into the folder, if I go to my Documents folder, let's say I want to move uh, some of these PDF files. Let's see these three PDFs. I'll just select the first one, hold the Shift key down, and select the last one. So these three PDFs, I can just drag and drop them, hover over the PDF docs entry in the sidebar, and then let go. To remove the PDF docs from my favorites in the sidebar, if I just move this window over slightly, I can drag it out, hold down the command key, and let go. Now you'll notice that the folder has disappeared from my favorites, but if I go back to my Screencast Online home folder, the folder is still there. It's just I've removed it from my favorites in the sidebar, and my files are still in there. Double click, and then the three files I dragged across. Now let's just go back across to the Documents folder. Let's say I wanted to create a new subfolder with these three JPEG files. I could either go through the same process, create a new folder using the File menu, or now I can select the files. So I'll select the first file, hold down the Shift key, select the last file, then Control or right click, and just say New Folder with Selection. Three items, and that creates a new folder for us. Now to rename that folder while it's highlighted, I just hit the Return key, and then I can overtype the name. Hit Return, and there's our new folder. To rename a file, let's say I wanted to rename this first file. Again, just highlight the file, hit the Return or Enter key, and then just overtype the name. To delete a file, once it's highlighted, as we saw before, just Command Backspace will send that to the trash. Let's have a quick look at the trash while we've just deleted that file. If I go down to the dock, click on Trash. You can see all the different files that I've deleted, some disk image files, some zip files, and we should see, there we go, lakesideview.jpg. That's the file I've just deleted. Now, I could at this point, if I wanted to empty the trash can and permanently remove all the items that have been trashed, 
Or if I want to restore this back to its original position, I can control or right click and then just say put back. And that file is put back into the original place where it was deleted from. So let me delete that again. Command backspace, look at the trash. And we'll say empty. Are you sure you want to permanently erase the items in the trash? Empty trash. One thing you need to be familiar with when using the Finder is when you connect external media, such as a USB drive or say a USB flash drive. Uh, let me just insert one into the USB socket on this MacBook Air. And there we have our USB drive. So that now becomes accessible from the Finder. I can select the files. Uh, I'll select individual files this time by holding down the command key. So let me just select every alternate file. If I want to copy this to my documents folder, just click and hold and drag them across to documents. If I hover over, you'll see the documents folder opens. If I wanted to drag this to my images folder, I could just go across to images and that can now go in images. The main thing though is if you do use an external drive, make sure before you remove the drive that you eject the drive from your system. Uh, if you don't, it could actually damage the files on the drive. So we have this small little eject symbol here. I'm just going to eject the USB drive. Once it's safely ejected, I can then remove it from the system. Now, if you want to learn more about the Finder, and there's a lot more to learn, to be honest, uh, you need to check out SEO Tutor for Lion, where I look at the Finder in much more depth. And you can find that on the Mac App Store. This section explains some of the new ways you can open and save files in OS X Lion. Now, if I start off by opening text edit, I'll use uh, Spotlight, so Command Spacebar, and then just type in text. And the top hit is Text Edit, the word processor supplied with OS X. And I'll just enter a line of text. Okay, we'll highlight that line of text. And go into Format, Font and bigger. I can use Command and Plus to make it bigger. In fact, let me make it even bigger. And Command B for bold. Now, I'm not going to save the document. What I'm going to do is just close text edit. So quit text edit, and it's gone. Now, one thing you probably noticed there, I didn't save the document, but it never prompted me to save the document when I tried to close the application. So you might think that I've actually lost that document now, but there is a feature within OS X Lion called Auto Save. So if I load text edit back up, so again, Command Spacebar, I just remembered text edit as my top hit, hit return, text edit reloads, and that document is presented to me. And that's all part of autosave. So in theory, if you have applications that are specifically optimized for Lion, you shouldn't really lose any data from this point on. And also you don't need to worry too much about hitting command S to save all the time. Autosave will save your work for you. Now, because I haven't saved this, this is sort of kept in memory or as a temporary file somewhere, but invariably you do want to save the file to your hard disk so you can retrieve it later if you do actually close the file. So if we go to the file menu, and you'll see there is an option to save, uh, Command S. So if I hit save, we'll get this small drop down sheet. So let's give it a name. But because this is just a small dialog box, I am limited really to where I can save it. I can either save it on my devices or in any of the folders within favorites within the finder. So you might want to save it somewhere else. Uh, to do that, all you need to do is just click on this small downward arrow and you get this nice large dialog box with many more features. So it's sort of like a mini finder. So I can change the view, have the cover flow view, list view, icon view, etc. Let's put it back to list view. Uh, I can navigate my sidebar. Uh, I can also create a new folder. So let me create a new folder in my documents folder. So we'll call this RTF docs. RTF is rich text format. We'll say create. And let's say save. Now, because we've saved the document, you'll notice up in the toolbar, we actually have the name of the document, first document.rtf. So let me go down here and add a second line of text. All right, it's still bold and in black. Let me change that color though to uh, red. Now, up in the title of the document, we have still the document name, but also we have the word edited. So OS X Lion knows that this document has changed since we last saved it, and it's now got this edited state. Now, if I go back up to File, you'll see that there is no file save anymore. Uh, there is save a version, and there is duplicate. 
but normally file save is command S and you'll see save a version is command S. This is where some confusion arises because uh, command S still is to save the document. It basically though just creates a second copy of the document or even a third or a fourth copy, but basically a version of the document. And if I do command S, you'll see that the edited symbol has gone and we're back to just first document to RTF. Now versions, is, again, is another new technology built into Line that enables you to keep lots and lots of different versions of the same document so that you can always go back and restore an older version of the document and you can even copy and paste between versions of the same document. Uh, to get to your versions, all you do is go back up to the title of your document and you'll see this small arrow, or this small triangle. If we click on that, we've got lock, duplicate and browse all versions. Let me click on browse all versions. Okay, so this on the left hand side is the current document. These are the versions on the right hand side. So we have a timeline. So if I go back to the very first version, that was just when we had a line of text. It's auto saved the document for me at this point. And then at this point here, this is when I did um, a command S to save a version. Let's go back to done and let's add some additional text into my document. Let's highlight that and make that green, say. And the document header is now reflected. It's been edited. Now, I don't need to keep typing Command S or save a version. It will be done automatically for me by the system, and that's really dependent on how much text you're typing, how long you're spending on the document, or if you close the document, it will save a version at that particular point. But just to prove something to you, if I do Command S again, Right, I've saved a new version. If I go back into versions, browse all versions. Okay, so there's my current document, the last version I saved. Go to the timeline, look at the previous version and the version before that. Okay, copy and paste. If I say done, uh, let me delete this first line of text. So this is my current document. Let's save a version. Command S, back into versions, browse all versions. Okay, and what I can do now, I can actually navigate by tapping on the header of each document to go back. Let's say I want to copy that line, so Command C to copy. Go back over here. Let's say I want to put that on the end, Command V, and then say done. And there's my new edited document. Let's say I wanted to restore the very first version of this document. Again, go into versions, browse all versions, go back to the very first document by clicking on it. Say restore. All right, and that's now back to as it was originally. So autosave and versions are a very, very powerful way of keeping control of your documents. This is another tip for you, and it's to do with file save as. You're probably familiar with file save as. That's when you get a document, uh, make an edit, and then you want to save it as a different document. Handled slightly differently in OS X line. Uh, let me start off by closing down first document.rtf. And then what we will do, let's go into the finder. There is my RTF docs folder. Now, if you're like me, what you'll tend to do is you'll say, ah, right, I need to create a new document, but I'm going to base it on this one, this first document. So I'll open up the document. And then I'll start typing. Uh, let's say I didn't really want this to be a line of text. This is my new document. Okay, let me file save as. And then you go to here, and there is no file save as. You can save a version, but you don't really want to do that, because that's just going to save a version uh, of the existing document. What you need to do is say duplicate. Now, two options here. I've actually changed first document. So I can duplicate it and those changes will be reflected in the second copy of the document. But if I've made a mistake and I didn't really want to alter my original document, I can actually now use this duplicate and revert. So that's the one I tend to use most. If I select that, what will happen there's my first document copy. If I go back to the original one, 
this is a line of text. So it's put that back to how it was before. So I haven't lost anything. I haven't overwritten anything. I've still got my original document, but now I have the second document that I can now save with a new name. And to do that, I just go back to file. And now I have the option not to save as a version, but to save. So if we save that, we'll call this second document and then save. So in effect, that's the new way of doing a file save as. You go into the document, you say duplicate, and then you give the new document a new name. And I have to say, although it's a little bit fiddly and it does take a little bit of getting used to, that has saved me no end of problems uh, when I tend to go into old documents, change them and try to do a file save as. I can just do a duplicate and revert and keep the original document. Now, another way I could have done this, uh, if I definitely didn't want to edit this first document, I could control or right click and from the finder, say duplicate, and that will create a duplicate of that document. I can then rename it from here. So to rename, hit the enter key, rename it, return again, and that gives me a new document that I can now start to edit. This section is all about setting up mail on your Mac. Now you may have a Gmail account, you may have another email provider, but there is a great mail client built into OS X, uh, which is commonly referred to as Apple Mail. Now, if you haven't got either Gmail or uh, an external email provider, you might want to consider getting an iCloud account. Now, iCloud is a new account that's been provided by Apple that gives you both a free email account, some online storage, and some of the facilities as well. Now, what I will do is I'll show you how to set up an iCloud account, how to configure your mail for iCloud, and then uh, a Gmail account as well. So let's start off by having a look at iCloud. So if I go to System Preferences, we go to the dock and start System Preferences. And then under Internet and Wireless, I'll double click on iCloud. As I mentioned previously, I prefer to have a separate Apple ID for my Mac App Store and iTunes accounts and a completely separate Apple ID for my iCloud account. So for this part of the tutorial, I'm going to create an Apple ID. So let's go ahead. Select my location, birthday, and let's get a free at me.com address. So say next. You must read and agree to the iCloud terms of service. So continue. And basically that's it. We'll use iCloud for contacts, calendars, and bookmarks. The nice thing with iCloud is that if you have an iOS device or if you have other Macs, uh, as long as you sign in using the same iCloud account, all your data will be synchronized into the cloud and then pushed down to all your other devices. So it's a really neat feature and it's free as well. You do have to pay for some additional storage if you go above the set limits, but uh, for a standard user, uh, iCloud should normally be free. There's also the option for Find My Mac, and this is where you can track your laptop using the Find My Mac service built into iCloud. We'll say Next, and we will allow Find My Mac to use the location of this Mac. Right, I will select Mail and Notes, and we'll look at PhotoStream separately, and I'll leave Back to My Mac to another time. That's the feature where you can access your Mac from a remote location. But uh, basically, that's it. That's iCloud set up. So if we close down iCloud, let's go to Mail. And already, it's been set up for me. Two messages. Welcome to iCloud. And also, welcome to iCloud Mail. If you want to set up a Gmail account, uh, all you would need to do is go to Mail Preferences. There's my current iCloud IMAP. Uh, IMAP is a type of mail service. Uh, that's all set up for me automatically by signing up to the iCloud process. Let's just hit the plus button and let's add another email address. This time I'll use my Screencast Online email address. Now put in my password and we'll say create. I won't set up calendars and chat, but basically that's it. It's very, very simple to do. So there's my two services, iCloud and Gmail. Let's close down the preferences and let's show our mailboxes. There they are. 
Now for clarity, I've deleted the Gmail mailbox. I really just wanted to show you how to set it up. Uh, a very quick look around mail. Again, SEO Tutor for Lion goes into mail in a lot more detail. Uh, if we want to create a new mail, we just select this button here, compose new message. And we now get this uh, pop-up panel. I'll address this to another email account I have. We'll give it a subject. And then the body. And then we'll send. Now, when the person responds, we should see both the uh, new email that's come in and also a copy of the mail that was sent out. So let me send a response from a different machine. And there we are from Don McAllister. Retest message from SEO Tutor for Mac. Now, if I click on show related message in the toolbar, you'll see we get this new view of the original message and also the response that's come in. And this is a really neat way of keeping track of threaded email conversations. Lots more to show you, but as I say, check out SEO Tutor for Lion for more details. Now, one of the problems of working in a windowed environment is that it's very easy to end up with a very messy desktop. OS X Lion does have a whole host of features to enable you to control the layout of the windows on the desktop and even to get them out of the way if you don't want them there or to make them go full screen if you want to focus and concentrate on one particular application. But uh, let's start off with this typical messy desktop. I've got four applications. If I use Command and Tab, you'll see we have ScreenFlow, my recording package. We have the Finder. We also have iCal, which is the calendar application. And also we have Safari. And in the background as well, if I tab along, yes, we have Mail. So let's say I wanted to work on Safari. So I'll just command tab to Safari release. Right, there's my Safari window. If I want to get rid of all the other windows, the easiest thing is to go to the Safari menu and say hide others. And all the other windows on the desktop then disappear. You can bring them back one by one. So you can use command and tab again. If I want my mail back, if I want my calendar back, or my finder, or if I just go back to Safari, do a hide others, and if I want them all back in one go, I can just say Safari show all. Let's hide them for now though, and focus on just a single window. So I'll just select hide others. You can use Alt or Option Command H to do this as well. It's possible now to grab any part of the window. You'll see as I go across the edge of the window, my cursor changes to, in this case, a dual headed arrow. I can just click and hold and then drag to resize the window. I can also grab these sides. I can also grab the corners. Now, if I want to keep, you'll see this is a pretty free flowing, really. I can drag it in any direction. If I want to keep the aspect ratio, if I hold the shift key down, you'll see because I have the shift key down, it's constrained in the way that it will resize the window. As well as being able to drag the window size using the edges. There are three controls in every Mac application that allow you to manage the window sizing. There's the close button, there's the minimize button, and the zoom button. Now the zoom button does confuse people. It's not a maximize button, which again is something different if you're coming from the Windows environment. It's an intelligent zoom. But what it does is to resize the window to fit the content of the window. Now this particular web page is only a certain width. So there's no real need to have this go full screen when I maximize the window. I really only need to have the window as large as the content is contained within the window. So if I hit the zoom button, you'll see that's what it does. It doesn't go full screen. It doesn't extend out to the edge of the screen. It just fits around the content within the web page. If I want to put it back to the same size as it was before, click zoom again and it will return. The next button is the minimize button. And this will just minimize the application down to the dock. I have some other Safari windows minimized here as well. That's the one I've just minimized. Let's bring that back up. And the third button is the close window button. Now this won't quit the application again, slightly different from the windows environment. When you click on this red button, it closes the window. It doesn't close the application. In most cases, there are some applications where it will close the application, but in most instances, it will just close the window. So let me close that Safari window. We just have the two minimized Safari windows that we had before. 
let's maximize one of these. Okay, again, it's just a small window. If I want to do a smart zoom, I click on the green button and it will extend just to encapsulate the contents of the page. Now, it might well be that you don't want to go into a smart zoom mode. You actually do want the application to completely fill the screen. This can be to offer a distraction-free environment or just allow you to focus on the particular application that you're working on. And within OS X Lion, they've introduced a brand new feature called full screen mode. Now, this is only available to applications that have been optimized for Lion, but you can recognize those by the symbol in the top corner. Now, this is Safari. This is supplied by Apple, and you'll see this double-headed arrow. If I click on that double-headed arrow, it immediately goes into full screen mode. So we lose the menu bar at the top. There's no dock. It's just the application itself. In this case, with the URL bar across the top. So now I can go to, say, another page. Again, just Safari, another page again. Some nice new gestures built into OS X Lion as well. If I use a two-finger swipe, I can actually go back through my history and see the pages that I visited within Safari. If I want to access the dock, scroll down to the bottom and do a double swipe, and the dock pops up. If I want the menu bar back, just scroll up to the top and the menu bar reappears. To come out of full screen mode, just click on this blue icon in the menu bar. Now, most applications supplied with Lion and a lot of third party applications are now lionized, as I call it, and will support this full screen mode. For instance, if I go across to my mail application, I'll see these same two symbols. I click on there, and I now have mail in full screen mode. While it's in full screen mode, if I want to get back to my desktop, again, there are some additional gestures a four finger swipe to the right will take me back to my desktop. Four finger swipe to the left takes me back to my full screen mode in Apple Mail. Let's leave Mail in full screen mode, go back to the desktop. We'll go to Safari and say Show All. And let's resize this window manually. There we go, that's the other Safari window. Okay, let's have a look at another new feature which is called Mission Control. Mission Control is another new feature in OS X Lion that helps you manage your window environment. Now, to access Mission Control, it's all controlled by gestures. The gestures are found within either the mouse or the trackpad section within System Preferences. Quick tip to get quickly to your gestures. If you command space, start typing gestures. Top option, System Preferences, Trackpad. Select that. And these are the various gestures. If you go to More Gestures, You'll see these are the gestures that control mission control and something else we'll look at app expose now i have these sets to swipe with four fingers so that's swipe up for mission control and swipe down for app expose let me close those so to go into mission control four finger swipe up on the trackpad and we get this new view so in the view across the top we have our dashboard we have our current desktop and we have our full screen application we have mail now, because we have the desktop highlighted, I've got my three applications here, iCal, Safari, two windows of Safari, and the Finder as well. So if I wanted to go straight to the Finder, I could click on the Finder, and that will bring the application to the front. Let's go back into Mission Control, four finger swipe up. If I now wanted to, I can create additional desktops. So the easy way to do that is to go up into the corner, and you'll see we get this little pop-up. If I click on there, we'll get a new desktop too. Let's create a desktop three. So these are in effect virtual desktops. So you're not limited to just the single desktop that you have on your Mac. You can create these virtual desktops and then quickly switch between them. Let's say for instance, you wanted iCal on desktop three. I can just grab iCal and just drop it on desktop three. Select desktop three and there's the application all on its own in its own desktop. If I want to change the desktop background, I can do individually, so just control or right click on this desktop. Let's change the background. Let's select this one here. Now to return to the other desktops, I can either four finger swipe up and then just move across the top and click on the desktop I want or the full screen application. Or if I just come out of mission control, I can use a four finger swipe to the right. That takes me to each desktop in turn my full screen application, and the back to desktop one. Four fingers to the left, my full screen application, desktop number two, and desktop number three. Four finger swipe up, and back in mission control. 
New for Lion 10.7.2 is the ability to rearrange your desktops. So I can actually move these around and resort them. If I want to close a desktop or delete a desktop, I just hover over the desktop till the X appears and click on the X. Now you'll notice in this display, I have my dashboard as a separate desktop. So what I can do now, if I go to desktop one, do a four finger swipe to the right, and that brings my dashboard to the front. Four finger swipe to the left, back to my desktop. Now App Exposé is slightly different. So you'll see here, I have two Safari windows. Let's say that Safari window was obliterated, but I wanted to see all my Safari windows in one view. All I do is a four finger swipe down. Let me highlight Safari first, four finger swipe down, and there are my two Safari windows. I can just move between them, select the one I want, and that will pop to the front. Let's go into full screen mode, and there's my Safari session. Out of full screen mode by going up to the menu bar and clicking on the icon. This section is all about installing a printer or scanner on your Mac. Now, obviously, the instructions are going to vary from machine to machine. It depends really on the type of printer that you're going to connect. For this demo, though, I'm going to connect the HP DeskJet 1050 all-in-one, which is both a printer and a scanner. And the printer has been supplied with some software that they recommend that you install on your Mac. Now, it's a good idea to install the supplied software, although you'll find that if you just connect a printer, your Mac will actually go away and try and download the relevant drivers from the internet for you automatically. So I'm going to go ahead, just for illustration, and install the standard software that's been provided with the printer. Now, it's on a CD, so I've connected an external CD driver to my MacBook Air, and we'll just let that disk load. Okay, so the CD has been recognized. There's a HP installer. Uh, there's also a readme folder. Let's just open that up. Now it is a HTML file, it's a web file. So I could just double click and load it in Safari or I can use the built-in quick look. Just hit spacebar and that allows me to view the contents of the readme file. Now a couple of things here, system requirements supported Mac environment 10.5 and 10.6 Mac OS 10. I have 10.7. So this CD, and you'll find this sometimes in that the CD that the vendors supply with the printers can be out of date. So it's worth going across to the vendor website and checking to see if they've published some more recent drivers. Now I know for a fact that they haven't published specific line drivers on the HP website, so I'm not going to do that. So I'm actually not going to use the supplied software. I'm going to eject the CD. All right, once ejected, what I am going to do is plug the printer directly into the Mac. Now before I do that, let me close this down. I need to go into System Preferences. Or within system preferences, there is a print and scan option. So if I select that, no printers are set up or are available rather. So let's just go ahead and plug our printer into our Mac. And there we go. The Mac has actually recognized it. Line has recognized that I've connected the HP DeskJet 1050 J410 series printer. We'll say download and install by clicking on the install button. We'll say agree. And that will go ahead and download the latest drivers for this printer. Okay, that's downloaded, updated, and installed. Now there's one warning here, printer sharing is turned off. This is an option once you have installed your printer, and don't forget this is a printer that's physically connected via a USB connection to this Mac. I can now make this available to other Macs on the network. Now, as you can see, share this printer on the network is switched on but printer sharing, which is something completely different, is switched off. Now we can switch that on by going to sharing preferences. And there we go. If we enable printer sharing, so printer sharing is now on. So this will now appear on the network when people try to add new printers to their Mac. So very straightforward, very easy to install a printer. Just be aware that the disk that's supplied with the printer mightn't be up to date for Lion. So you might need to just plug it in and go ahead and let Lion download the correct printer drivers and install it for you automatically. Let's have a quick look at open print and scan preferences. Let's go to scan. Okay, I can also share the scanner on the network. If we go back to sharing preferences and now scanner sharing is enabled as well. So this way, just a single printer scanner combination machine can support your family or your small business on the same network. 
Now that we have our printer set up, let's have a look at printing from OS X. Now I've loaded Safari up, we're on the apple.com start page, and let's say I wanted to print out this web page. Well, I can do a simple keyboard shortcut of Command P, or go to the File menu and select File, Print. And that produces this special dialog box. This is called a sheet. This is when the dialog box sort of drops down from the top of the application toolbar. This is a simple view, but what I will do is going to show details to see more information. Okay, so we have a preview of the document to be printed over here, so I can page through. This is a two-page document, so I can page through a page at a time, or jump to the end by using the controls down here, just to double check how it's going to look like. Let me jump back to the beginning. The printer, well, there is a single printer on this system, the DeskJet that I've just installed. I can select nearby printers. Now, because I'm on a local area network and I have other Macs with other printers, I can actually see those printers across the network. So I have a Canon printer on my Mac Pro. This DeskJet entry actually is the, uh, I've just removed that. This is the machine I've connected to this local Mac. And I also have a DVD printer as well. These other things are services that I can send to other applications so I can print directly to various applications. More information about that on some of these Screencast Online weekly shows. If I wanted to add a printer, I can do at this point. I can also access my print and scan preferences. Let's just have a quick look at that. This is the same as going in through the system preferences pane. I might want to, for instance, have a look at my options and supplies. I can check my driver, my supply levels. I think I'm running a little bit low on ink. Yep, so I could do with replacing my color ink cartridge. There is also for this printer a utility. Now, again, this is specific to this printer, so you might not see this, but I can go in and do some testing, clean the printheads, etc. But that is down to the software that's been supplied for your actual printer. Okay, let's close that down. We'll say cancel, and we'll close this down as well. There are some presets. So if you want to use photo paper or plain paper, best fast draft, fast draft black and white, we can create our own presets, specify the number of copies, specify the range to be printed, either all or specify a page range, select your paper size, lots of different paper sizes, the orientation, whether or not it's portrait or landscape and the scale. And then here we have some selectable parameters. So options to control the layout, options to control the color matching, paper handling, and also the cover page, whether or not we have a cover page or not. Options for the paper type, and then direct access to our supply levels. So I didn't really need to go into the utility. It's actually built into this drop-down sheet. Once I'm happy, I can just go ahead and click print, but you might want to print directly to paper. You might want to print to a PDF. Uh, again, that's handled completely seamlessly within OS X. If we go down to this button here, PDF, I can open a PDF in preview, so I can print the contents of this web page to a PDF, now, PDF is the portable document format prescribed by Adobe and is sort of pretty much an industry standard for the creation of electronic documents that are sort of interchangeable. Once you print in a PDF, everything is contained within the PDF. So if you have uh, special fonts on your system that perhaps might be replicated on other machines, if you print to a PDF, a person who receives a PDF on another machine will see the exact representation of what it is you've printed. So I can open it in preview. I can just save it to my file system. Save as PostScript, which is a specialized format, mainly for professional printers. I can fax the PDF, but only if I have a fax connected to this particular machine. I can add the PDF to iTunes. iTunes will support PDFs. I can mail it to somebody, save it to my web receipts folder, but I can edit this menu as well. Let me just open the PDF in preview. Okay, so that's now printed out, and I can actually look at the contents of the PDF within Preview. I can even annotate it at this point. Again, for more information about Preview, check out SEO Tutor for Lion on the Mac App Store or visit screencastonline.com for my more in-depth tutorials on Preview. But we'll close that down for now. So to go back to printing, file print, I will actually print this out on the printer. We'll say print. Now you can... Well, you can probably hear that in the background. Now, I can examine the print queue. There we go. Now, I can quickly jump to the print queue. I can see it's printing this particular page on page two. From here, I can delete the print job, hold it, get more information, pause printer, go to supply levels, or back into printer setup. But we'll just let that complete. 
and that's now completed. Close that down and close Safari. As well as sharing your printer and scanner, there are other things you can share within System Preferences. So if you open your System Preferences panel and under Internet and Wireless, select the Sharing folder. So there's our printer sharing and scanner sharing that we looked at in a previous module. We have the option to do screen sharing. Now this is where you configure your Mac to allow other people to access the screen of your Mac remotely. There's file sharing, which allows you to share files and folders with other people either on the same Mac or on different Macs on the same local area network. Web sharing allows you to set up a local web service and create a local website on your Mac. Remote login is a facility whereby you can allow people to remotely log into your machine using a secure technique called Secure Shell. Remote management allows you to give users using Apple Remote Desktop access to your machine as well as remote Apple events to allow applications on other OS X computers to send Apple events to this computer. XGrid sharing is a way of creating a distributed group of computers all sharing various tasks, mainly used in the scientific field, to be honest. Uh, internet sharing allows you to share your local internet connection with someone else, say, on a wireless device, and then Bluetooth sharing to allow you to copy and transfer files using Bluetooth. But for this section, we'll just look at file sharing. This is the ability to set up file sharing either locally on the same machine or to other Mac users across your local network. Now, before we switch on file sharing, I'm going to change my computer name. Currently, it's Screencasts Online MacBook Air, which is a bit long and unwieldy. So what I will do, in fact, let me take the name off completely. I'm just going to change this to MacBook Air 11. So this is the 11-inch MacBook Air, and hit return. Okay, so computers on your local network can now access your computer at macbook-air-11.local. You don't need to worry about that too much because you will actually see MacBook Air 11 appear on the other machine once you switch on file sharing. So let's go ahead and switch on file sharing. Right, file sharing is now on. So currently by default we have a shared folder. Now this is my public folder. OS X creates a public folder for every user that has an account on the machine. And that public folder has some default permissions. So I can read and write to that folder, but everybody else basically can only read that folder. Now if I open the Finder, let me just go across to the Finder. Now you'll find your public folder within your home folder, and then as well as desktop documents, downloads, movies, music, etc., there is the public folder. Within the public folder is a special folder called the Dropbox. Okay, let me show you how this works. This PDF, let's say I wanted to share this PDF on the network so that other people could access this file, but only read the file. I don't really want them to edit it. So if I drag that and drop it into my public folder, and let's now go across to another machine and see what that looks like. So this is a cross over on a second Mac. This is on my Mac Pro, which is on the same local area network as the MacBook Air 11 inch. And if you notice in the shared section, we have MacBook Air 11, so it can actually see the machine across the network. So if I click on the MacBook Air 11, it will initially connect me as a guest. And because I'm connected as a guest, it should show me my public folder on the other machine. And there we go, Screencast Online's public folder. If I click on the public folder, there we go, it shows you my Dropbox folder and also the PDF that I copied across on the MacBook Air. Now I can do several things. I can read this PDF fine. So if I highlight the PDF and hit spacebar, I can read it in Quick Look fine. I could open it with preview. I can even drag a copy off. So if I wanted to copy on my desktop, I can just drag it and that's now on my desktop. What I can't do, though, is to edit this file or delete it. The permissions of the public folder for Screencast Online on the MacBook Air don't allow me to do that. So if I try to delete by Command Backspace, and then try and delete, I'll need to enter my admin password on this machine, but I can't delete it because I don't have permission to access some of the items. So that's the public folder. Now, if I wanted to copy a file from my Mac Pro, across to the MacBook Air using the same technique. If I drag this, say, this image file, you'll see that I can't drop it onto the public folder. I get the, uh, the symbol on the icon to indicate that I can't actually copy that. I don't have permission to copy it. But if I copy it to the Dropbox on the remote machine, so there's the Dropbox and release, you can put items into Dropbox, but you won't be able to see them. Do you want to continue? So we'll say OK. 
Now that's a sort of protected folder. I can't see the contents but I've dropped that file into the Dropbox and the person on the MacBook Air should be able to see that. So let's go across to the MacBook Air and have a look in the Dropbox. So back over to the MacBook Air and if I open my Dropbox folder, there's the image from the Mac Pro. Now, if you don't want people to have guest access to your Dropbox folder, and by the way, I should point out, the Dropbox folder is nothing to do with the third-party service called Dropbox. That's just a coincidence. So this is the Dropbox that's built in to Mac OS X. But if you want to stop guest access to your shared folders, what you can do is go to Show All, go to Users and Groups, and then you will find there a guest user. You might have to uncheck the lock to prevent further changes but mine is unlocked, so if I take that off, right, now the guest user is unable to connect to shared folders. So if anyone tries to connect to your public folder, they will need to have a login account. And we'll look at setting up different accounts in another module. Let's go back to show all, and then back to sharing. Now for security, if you are on a laptop and you take your laptop away from your home environment, you might want to switch off file sharing. We'll say okay. And that way no one on a different local area network can then access your file. So very important, if you are out and about with a laptop, you might want to switch off file sharing. Of course, one of the main reasons for buying a Mac is to access the internet and surf the web. And Apple provides their own web browser to do just that, and it's called Safari. So let me just start off by loading Safari. If I access it from the dock, by default, I have my home page, and the home page being the page that opens when I first open the browser as apple.com slash start page. Now, obviously, I can click on any of the links within this page to navigate to another page, or I can go up to the URL bar either by moving my mouse cursor up and clicking on the favicon next to the URL and retyping, or if I'm somewhere else in the page, just do a command L and that will highlight the URL for you. Let's go to the BBC website, bbc.co.uk, and let's go to the news site. Now let's say I wanted to have this as my homepage. I can change that in Safari Preferences. If I just go to Safari and down to Preferences, currently my homepage is apple.com slash start page. Let's set it to the current page. And now if I close Safari down, in fact, we'll close it completely either Command Q or Quit Safari. Let's start it up again, this time through Spotlight, SAF, Safari, and that will load that page as my new home page. Safari also includes integration with the three major search engines, Google, Yahoo, and Bing. Now to get to the Google search panel, I've currently got it set to Google. You can select any of these, but I'll leave it at Google. Again, if I'm on the page and I want to jump straight to that search panel, all I need to do is Command Option F, and that will move the cursor to the search panel. Let's do a quick search. And that takes me to a standard Google search. As well as a standard Google search, there is another search within Safari, and that's to search an actual web page. So for instance, if I go across to Screencast Online Extra, right, this is just a page about my weekly tutorials. Let's say I wanted to search to see, it's quite a long page, lots of information, Let's see if I wanted to check out if there was any information about Automator. I can do it Command F, and that produces this little panel below the uh, bookmark bar. So you can see here, it's already pasted in Screencast Online. There are 13 matches. If I just click on the X and start typing uh, Automator. So I've typed Auto, it's found three matches, and it's highlighted the first match on the page automatically. Now I could use these small arrows next to where it says three matches, to actually move through and look at all the different results. But let's carry on. There we go, Automator. And let's take me straight to that particular page. Uh, this is just a page illustrating some of the different tutorials that are available. Okay, let's say done. And let's go back to the search page. And you can use that Command F on any web page that you load. Let's go back to the BBC News page. Now, of course, as a trackpad user, I could have used a two-finger swipe. So if I do a two-finger swipe to the left, that brings that Google search back for me. A two-finger swipe to the right, 
and I'm back on the BBC News page. Now, Safari also supports tabbed browsing. Let's say perhaps we want to stay on this page, but we want to do another search, but have those results in a separate tab. I can create a brand new tab just by pressing Command T, and that gives me a new tab, and we get this new top site display, but more about that later. So now if I want to do another search, again, I can do Command Option F, that takes me to the Google search panel, and I just type in another search term. Now you'll notice as I'm typing, we also have suggestions. So it's found the maxscreencastguy.com, and that was the search term I was going to look for, but also recent searches as well. So my recent search for Screencast Online is still in place. And I could at this point, if I wanted to, change the search engine. Let's go ahead and select the maxscreencastguy.com, and there we go, another search. Click on the link, and that opens the page. Let's create another tab, Command T. And this time, let me uh, click on one of these entries within top sites. Let me go to Wikipedia. Okay, so that's now three tabs. And again, Command T for a fourth tab. And let's go across to YouTube. Now, it is possible to resort these tabs. So for instance, the second tab, if I wanted this to appear at the end of my tabbed list, I can just drag it across. And similarly, this first one, I can put into the second position. I can also drag these tabs off into separate windows. So if I click and drag, you'll see that tab has now become a completely separate Safari window. Let's do that with YouTube as well. So click and hold, drag down, and that's a new Safari window. If I want to merge all the windows together, I just go to Window, Merge All Windows, and that puts the three separate Safari windows into a single window, again with four tabs. Now, if I would like to save these tabs for later, let's say that's a suite of tabs that I've built up during some research, what I can do is go to Bookmarks, and then Add Bookmarks for these four tabs. So if I select that, and then select the Bookmarks bar, leave it as Save Tabs and say Add, You'll see over here on the bookmarks bar, I have this option for saved tabs. Click on that and that will reopen them. Let me close these tabs down. Click on save tabs again, and they open again. If I want to navigate the tabs just using the keyboard, I can use control tab, and that will take me to each tab in turn. Control shift tab takes me back. To delete those saved tabs, all I need to do is go into my bookmark section, and you'll see here under bookmarks bar, I have my saved tabs. Just select the entry, command backspace, and they're gone. The bookmarks bar is very useful and a very quick and easy way to navigate around your bookmarks. Let me close this down again. For instance, these bookmarks have been assigned by Apple. These are just standard bookmarks installed with the standard Safari. You can see I have Apple, Yahoo, Google Maps, YouTube, Wikipedia, and then some groups of tabs as well. So Apple is in the first position. So if I use Command-1, that will actually take me to the Apple bookmark. Command-2 to Yahoo. Command-3 to Google Maps. Now, 4 and 5 are YouTube and Wikipedia. 6 is a list, and 7 is also a list of bookmarks. So consequently, Command-6 won't actually do anything. It has to be a single link for the command actions to work. Let's go back to the BBC News site. If I want to create a link in the bookmark for this, what I can do is just grab the favicon and drag it down. Let me drop it next to Wikipedia and let go. Uh, type a name. I'll just leave it as BBC News. Say OK. So now if I go back to Command 1, which is the Apple site, Command 6 takes me to BBC News. Another way to create a bookmark is to use the little plus symbol next to the URL. If we click on there, gives us the option to add the page to the bookmarks bar, as we did before, but also to reading list or top sites. Now, top sites is the matrix of sites that you can configure, but reading list is a new feature within OS X Lion. So if I click on reading list, and we'll say add, see the animation, and we have this uh, small symbol here, this show reading list icon. If I click on there, you'll see that the page that I've kept has now been added to this list. Let's go to another page. And let's add this to the reading list as well. This time I'll just say add page. And one more, let me go to my blog. And again, add page. Now, if I want to add a link, say this SEO tutor for line link to my reading list without clicking on the link and going to the page, 
I can just hold down the Shift key and click, and that adds it into the reading list automatically. Now, when I'm ready to review my reading list, I can just tap on each one and read. To delete them, just click on the X to clear them from your reading list. And let's close down the reading list. Now, if I want to open any of these links in a separate tab, all I need to do, hold down the Command key and click, and that will open it in a new tab. Let's open that one as well. Okay, if I go to this tab, close the tab, Command W, Command W. Now, you may have noticed in the URL bar that we have this RSS symbol, and that just indicates that this particular page has an RSS feed associated with it. Now, an RSS feed is just a way of a website uh, what's called syndicating information and allowing the information that's contained within the web page to be read by an RSS aggregator, such things as Google Reader or similar applications. A Safari itself has got an RSS reader built in, and the way we access that for this particular page is just to click on the RSS symbol. And then we get this slightly more simplified view of the information on the web page. Now, this particular one has a relatively well, it has summaries and then more information. On some pages, you might see larger paragraphs than this, and then you can alter the article length just by moving this slider. But uh, this particular one is already summarized. You can sort by these different attributes, return it to date, so the newest is at the top. You can summarize the articles just for today, just for yesterday, just for the last seven days. Put it back to all, we can refresh, we can mail a link to this page, and we can also subscribe in email. Now the email application does allow you to subscribe to RSS feeds, so any new information published by the BBC News homepage would be sent across to your email system. But that's RSS, let me set it back to the normal view. And let me just click on this link here. This is a separate article on the web page, and something different now is that instead of RSS, it says Reader. Now, Reader is one of my favorite things with Safari, and basically what Reader does is to extract the text of the web page and put it in a nice clean display. This particular website isn't too bad, but on some websites, there are tons and tons of advertisements, tons and tons of flashing graphics that uh, distract you from reading the content. So if we click on Reader, there we go, we can see the main content of the page, including the graphics, nicely laid out in this nice clean text, and we can read that uh, distraction-free. Uh, if we scroll down to the bottom, in fact, you don't need to scroll down to the bottom. If you scroll down to the bottom of the reader panel, you'll see you can change the scale. You can email the contents. So that's flicked across to my full screen mail application. And there is the contents of the website that I can now email to somebody. Let's say cancel. And we'll do a four finger gesture to get back to here. We can print it or we can close Reader down from this point. A really useful feature built into Safari. Now, whilst we're on this page, something else to point out to you. You'll notice that down here, we have a video, but unfortunately we cannot play media. We don't have the correct version of the Flash player installed. Now, Flash is a subject of uh, high controversy in that Adobe have recently canned the mobile version of Flash, and the likelihood is that most websites will start to move away from Flash. Now, Flash is a proprietary standard from Adobe that uh, is a way of encoding and playing video content on websites. There are some interactive aspects to Flash as well, but the main thing is to play video on websites. Now, for the past, I think, over a year now, Apple have not installed Flash by default on new Macs. So if you get a new Mac, and this is a brand new Mac, a new build, the Flash player isn't installed. So you have two options. One, you can install Flash and just use Flash as it's intended to be. Uh, there are some downsides to that. People see lots of performance problems with Flash. Even on high power machines, they do tend to sort of use the CPU on the machine much more than they need to. Most people are tending to go across to the new HTML5 standard, which is less processor intensive and uh, doesn't sort of work the machine as much. But you can still download Flash and use Flash and then perhaps use a Flash blocker. Or alternatively, do not install Flash and then use something like the Chrome browser, which actually has Flash built into the browser itself, so you don't need to install Flash separately. What I will do is I will show you how to install Flash if you want to go down that route, and then I'll show you how to use a Flash blocker. There's a new architecture in Safari called Extensions, and there are a couple of Safari extensions that allow you to block Flash. So let me go ahead and download the correct version from here. 
Okay, download Adobe Flash Player. We'll say download now. All right, you will have seen an animation. This is the download list. I can either click on the Show Downloads button, or if I go to View, there is a shortcut, Show Downloads, or Alt or Option, Command L. Let's click that, and we see the list. It's a DMG file, as we saw in the installation module. DMG file is a disk image file. Let me just double click this from here. Opening and mounting the DMG file. Okay, we'll probably need to pop Safari down. And there it is. Let's install Adobe Flash Player. We'll say open. Read the license and say install. Add your admin password. You need to close Safari down. I can close it from here. And there we go, it installs. We'll say done. Let's minimize that window and let's create a new finder window. And our disk image file is in the sidebar. We'll just unmount the disk image file and close that down. Right, so if we reopen Safari, it remembered my last tabs. So what I can do from here is if I just do a two finger swipe, that will actually take me back to the original page. And now I should be able to play this. The journey to a more balanced world economy. Okay, so that's the Flash player installed. Now I mentioned before that you can disable Flash. There's a thing called a Flash blocker, which will attempt to replace Flash video with HTML5 video, which is a, a lot less processor intensive. Now we can go to the Safari extensions page and have a look and see what's available. Now to do that, if we go to Safari, and go down to Safari Extensions. So this is the Safari Extensions Gallery. There are tons and tons and tons of different extensions that you can install into Safari to do all sorts of different things. The one I want is this one, Click to Flash. We'll install now. There are some attributes here you can have a look at. I'm just gonna leave it as default. So if I close this down, close this down, and let's refresh the page. Now it looks the same. If I click on it though, the Flash plugin has detected that it's a Flash video. So sometimes if there is an alternative video, such as the HTML5 video, I'll show you that on YouTube, it will play the HTML5 video. But in this instance, there isn't, there is only the Flash. So you can either leave it, and then the Flash player won't kick in and uh, start heating up your machine, or you can just play. The journey to a more balanced world let me show you on YouTube. If I go across to YouTube, you'll see here this banner is Flash. Let's search for one of my Screencast Online videos. Uh, the Scrivener Show. And there we go, that's now playing in HTML5. And the nice thing is, if I control or right click, I can reset the Flash video, or I can download this video to my Mac. So you can download videos from YouTube straight to your Mac. One feature of Safari that uh, most people tend to forget about is the ability to create web clips. Now, web clips are segments of web pages that can be added to your dashboard. And these clips can be sort of dynamic, they get updated in real time. And one neat thing I've seen people doing is to go across to the iPod Nano page. Now, this is the new iPod Nano. And you can see here this Mickey Mouse clock it actually is a live rendering, a live HTML5 rendering of the iPod Nano uh, Mickey Mouse clock, which shows the real time and date. So you can see it's the 16th today, and it's about uh, seven minutes past three. What you can actually do is to embed just a small segment of this web page onto your dashboard. And the way to do that is go to File, and then say Open in Dashboard. So now we need to select a part of the web page. So let's uh, roughly position it over, over there. Okay, and now that I've clicked, I have these handles that I can drag. Let's drag the whole image of the Nano. Okay, once we've got that, we just say Add. And there is my clip. Let's position that here. Now you can see there's the original dashboard clock, and this is the, the real-time updating from the web page showing that uh, we actually do have the correct time to the second. While I'm on the dashboard, I haven't really covered it in this series of modules, 
but uh, the dashboard some people like it some people don't it's nice to have what you can do is you can configure it we've already installed the dash cards in if i want to delete any of these elements and replace them you can just go down here click on the plus button these are some of the additional widgets that are available to you if you want to manage the current widgets you just click on here so if i wanted to remove dash cards i could just hit this minus do you want to move the widget to the trash we'll say okay and then if we delete or rather close this window again click on here uh, we get these little x's above the existing widgets so we can remove them from the desktop if we want let's say add a new one in ski report and most of these widgets have a little information panel at the back that you can configure but uh, that's just a slight aside let's uh, put this back oh by the way mission control as well it, it becomes part of mission control so you can slide to it and it appears on mission control as well if you want to switch that off all you need to do let's go out of mission control let's go to system preferences and then in system preferences if you select mission control take off show dashboard as a space close that down we'll close that now if i go into mission control the dashboard doesn't appear now this also means we can't get to the dashboard by using the four finger gesture. The way we do it is to use function F12, at least on this machine. If you look in your mission control preferences, you'll see which keyboard combination will work on your keyboard. But if I hold down function and F12, this time the dashboard is overlaid on top of our desktop. So it's uh, that's the more traditional way of displaying the dashboard. And as you can see, the Mickey Mouse clock is still running. And then function F12 to remove the dashboard. You can get to your history from the menu bar. This will show you all your history. Or you can go to the top sites. And then in top sites, you can get a graphical view of your history and use this sort of quick look or carousel type view to see all your web pages. You can search here as well. So if I search for Nano, there's my Nano. You can clear your history from here as well. If you don't want things to appear in your history, what you need to do is go into Safari and then select Private Browsing. When you select private browsing, it will keep your browsing history private. It doesn't remember the pages that you visit or your search history or your autofill information. So I'll just say cancel to that. For this section, I thought we'd take a look at users and accounts and also a quick look at parental controls as well. The nice thing with the Mac is that it is a fully multi-user system. Even if you have a single Mac, you can still have separate accounts for different people who can all use it independently of each other. There are some quite sophisticated controls for managing your computer, especially if children use it. So to get to the users and accounts, we go to system preferences. And we have, here we go, users and groups. Now, by default, the first user that's set up on the machine is an administrative user. And this user has full access to the entire machine and can control the machine as well. Uh, there's also a guest user. Let me just click this lock. To make some changes put in my admin password okay so we have guest user which is currently disabled but the reason it's disabled you might by default have this checked on which is for sharing only and this uh, goes back to the previous module about file sharing so uh, i'll select that and leave that on i will also allow guests to log into this computer now basically when a guest logs into this computer using the guest user they will have all their files and information that they create deleted when they log out. Now there is another guest user that you'll see on the login page, and that's a special user that's set up by iCloud if you have Back to My Mac set up. I suggest you go and check out one of these Screencast Online episodes all to do with iCloud to get more information about that particular user. Okay, so that's the guest user. Let's go ahead and set up another normal user. So if I click the plus button here, for this user, I'm going to create a standard account. Now, the standard account means they'll still be able to use the computer as normal, but they won't have full access to all the facilities. And also, if there's anything such as installing applications or doing something that might normally need administrative privileges, they won't be able to do that. So a standard user is normally fine. In fact, best practice does say that uh, for your own user, you should really use a standard user and just keep the administrative user when you need to do administrative tasks. But uh, if I'm honest, I tend to leave my current user as an admin user. But let's set up a standard user anyway. 
So I'm going to call this, uh, let's give it a full name, Joe Blogs. The account name we'll have as Joe Blogs as well. Uh, password. Now you can get it to create a password for you if you want through the password assistant, but uh, I'll leave mine in as is. And you can assign a password hint as well, but uh, I'm going to leave that blank. Okay, so now I can change my picture. Let's go with a gingerbread man. You can set the Apple ID at this point if you want. You can convert this to an admin user, but I'll leave that. And you can also enable parental controls. But uh, I'll leave that one set just as a normal user. But let's say we wanted to add a child in now. Now this time I'm going to select Managed with Parental Controls. This is going to be Jimmy, same account name, a password, and again, a password hint if you want. We'll create user. Okay, so we've got my Screencast Online account, admin, Joe Blogs, a standard account, and then Jimmy, which is a managed account. Let's go ahead and open parental controls. Parental controls are arranged in five main groups, the first being apps. We can do such things as to switch on a simple finder rather than the complex view of the finder that you have with a normal account. We can limit access to applications. The App Store apps are graded by age, so you can either not allow any of the apps or specify an age range for them to be allowed to access. Then you can also go in and identify individual applications and then either check or uncheck to allow them access. Now, because we've switched on the simple finder, you can't change the dock. If I take that off, you can then allow them to modify the dock or not. Access to logs, so you can see the applications that have been used. And also, when we look at the next section, websites visited, blocked, and also access to iChat as well. Uh, let's have a look at the web settings. So allow unrestricted access to websites, or we can try to limit access to adult websites automatically, which can be customized. You can add in specific websites to either always allow or never allow. Or you can create a specific list of websites that you will allow the user to log on to. So they are added to or taken away by these buttons down here. People, so this is access to others. So you can limit email and limit iChat. You basically control that by adding in allowed contacts. So you can uh, sort of monitor who it is that the child can chat to or can send mail and receive mail to and from. A neat feature is to send permission requests. So you can arrange to have a permission request sent to, say, your email address whenever the user attempts to exchange mail with a contact who you haven't approved. Time limits, so if you want to restrict the time when people can actually use the computer, split into weekdays and weekends. So you can limit the computer use to a number of hours or minutes. So if we check that, you can see we move this slider down to just half an hour a day or eight hours a day, etc. Similarly for weekend time limits and also for bedtime. So we can specify that we don't want the person to access the computer during these specified hours separately for school nights and for weekend, which again is a neat touch. And then on other, hide profanity in dictionary, limit the printer administration. You can limit CD and DVD burning to prevent any pirating of CDs and DVDs. And the last option, to disable them from changing their password in the users and groups preference pane. If there's one thing I would heartily recommend and even stress that you must do when you get a new Mac, that would be to set up a time machine and create a time machine backup. Now time machine has been in OS 10 for several releases now, and it's a built-in mechanism of both backing up your data and also the operating system of your computer so that you can restore it easily. It's very easy to set up and very inexpensive. There's no software to buy, it's built into the Mac. The only expense really is the external drive that you need to back up to. Now I'm going to connect a very inexpensive external USB drive to the machine and then we'll see the Time Machine message pop up. So I've plugged my USB drive, it's a 200 gigabyte USB drive, into my MacBook Air and this message has popped up. Do you want to use external USB drive 200 gigabytes to back up with Time Machine? Now, as far as the size of the drive that you select is concerned, you really need to get a drive that's at least twice the size of your hard disk that you're backing up, possibly bigger. I mean, you can pick up one terabyte drives very, very cheaply these days. The more space you have on your drive, the more you can actually back up and sort of go back in time to recover stuff. 
So I'm actually going to say don't use or rather decide later for this machine. I want to show you another option. So we'll say decide later. If I go into my time machine icon in the menu bar, if yours doesn't have a time machine icon in the menu bar, you can get to it through system preferences. I'm going to go and open time machine preferences. Okay, so currently time machine is off. And also we've got this icon is grayed out in the menu bar. Let's go ahead and select the disk. Okay, so there's the external USB drive that I've connected. It's also seen on the network I have a time capsule. Now a time capsule is a special device that Apple sell, which is basically a router or a router, depending where you're from, basically a network device that has a hard drive built in that you can use for time machine. But you don't need to have a time capsule. You can use any standard USB drive or Firewire drive or look into the future, any Thunderbolt drive that you can connect to your machine. Okay, let me select the USB drive and we'll say use backup disk. Now I'm going to just switch this off for a second because I don't want it to start yet. I want to have a look at the options. So the panel at the top of this box are exclusion items. So let's say for instance, well, this is only going to be 22 gigabytes. The full backup is going to be 22 gigabytes and it will back up everything it needs to restore your machine uh, to the point where by you last run time machine. You can also go in and pull out individual files or folders and restore them to your computer as well. But you might want to exclude stuff. I mean, you might want to exclude, for instance, my downloads folder. So if I click on the plus sign, let's select downloads. So I have stuff in there that I don't really want backing up because it's temporary. I can just say exclude. And that will reduce the size of my time machine backup only by 15 megabytes. But if you do have folders or files that you don't really need backing up, you can go in and exclude them from this particular point. Options to backup while on battery power. So if you're not connected to a main supply, you can still back up. Notify after old backups are deleted. Basically what will happen is Time Machine will keep backing up your system until the Time Machine backup drive is full. And then it will start to delete some of the older backups so that it should sort of rotate and uh, keep your most current backups up to date and then delete older backups when it starts to run out of space. This option to lock documents two weeks after last edit is a new feature. Within Lion, there is the option to auto save documents and you can actually lock your documents after two weeks to prevent any accidental changes to those documents. Or you can make it longer or shorter or you can take that off completely. I leave it as the default. Okay, so with those changes made, I'll say save and then I will switch Time Machine on. And basically that's it. Time Machine will run automatically. As you can see, the next backup is today at 15.57. If you want to kick it off straight away, I can just say backup now. And that will then start. And you'll see in the icon, in fact, quite neatly, the icon is working anti-clockwise to show that it's actually running. So this is gonna take a little while to back up the 16 gigabytes over USB. So I'll leave that running and then we'll have a look once it's completed. So that time machine backup has now completed. Actually, it didn't take too long, just over half an hour to do the full machine. So how are we going to test this? Well, let me put the system preferences down and let me open Finder. And what we will do, let's go to my documents and let's delete this images folder. And then let me go to trash and empty trash. So they are now permanently deleted. Okay, what I want to do now is to restore that images folder. So if I go to Time Machine and say enter Time Machine, you'll notice a subtle difference. Here we go. Right, the standard desktop drops out of the way. We get this different desktop. And we also now get a representation of the backups within Time Machine going back in time. Now, obviously, this is the first Time Machine backup, so there aren't that many. I will show you another machine that's uh, been using Time Machine for a while, so you can see an idea of how it looks. But down the side here, you would get a timeline of all the different Time Machine backups. So that's now, this is the latest backup today at 1640. So let's go back as far as we can. So that one, and there's my images folder. I'm actually in the documents folder. So if I select images, say restore, and there we go, that's it put back for me. So how easy is that? It's a really great way of keeping backups of all your data and uh, retrieving them very, very easily. Now, you can also use Time Machine if, for whatever reason, you need to rebuild your Mac. You can reinstall Lion, and then as part of the installation process, 
you can then plug in your time machine backup and restore from the time machine backup to get your machine back to the state it was before you had to rebuild it. So again, another good reason to use time machine. Now I said I'd show you another another machine that I've got time machine that's been running for a while on. So let me just show you that. So this is my main production Mac Pro, and you'll see up here we have Time Machine. And if I enter Time Machine, there you go, there's my desktop looking a bit messy. I've actually got two monitors on this machine, so all these files are actually uh, hidden away on my second monitor. But you can see here my timeline. So this is now going all the way back to July. So I can go back to any point in time, see what was on my desktop, say on Monday the 17th of October. Um, there we go, a few less things. How about October 27th? Yeah, I had a nice clean desktop. Uh, looks as though I created a tidy up folder and dragged everything into the tidy up folder. But I did know that there was a file, there was an MP3 file on my desktop at some point by a chap called Clayton. And uh, I don't remember what I do with it. I might have filed it away. I might have deleted it. I'm not too sure. But if I want to get it back, if I go into the search panel, type the word Clayton, And then select desktop, hit return. There we go. Clayton Christensen, capturing the upside. That was back in, well, it's actually a very old file, but that's the date it was created. I haven't got backups going back to 2005, but let's go ahead and say restore. Okay, and there it is my mp3 file well that just about wraps up this video tutorial and I hope you found it useful once you've become more familiar with the Mac and if you want to learn more about using lion check out SEO tutor for lion and the other screencast online titles available on the Mac or iOS app stores you can also visit the website screencastsonline.com to learn more about becoming a member and how you can receive a brand new video tutorial every week covering all sorts of Mac and iOS topics. As well as the new tutorial delivered automatically each week, members also get immediate access to over 300 videos, all designed to help you get the most out of your Mac, iPhone or iPad. So this is Don McAllister signing off and I look forward to speaking to you next time.